board is present. State Board of Education meeting of October 10, 2017 is called to order. Before the, I begin the meeting, I want to thank uh, Superintendent Ron Kniff for hosting us today and for all the great work of the staff. And so, Ron, where, where are you hiding? Thank you, Ron. Thank you to you and your staff for all the good work to make this meeting go on. So thank you. First item is approval of the agenda in order of priority. Is there any items to be added or deleted from the agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and supported to accept the order of priority. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. Introduction of State Board of Education members and guests at this time, Marilyn. Please introduce the members of the State Board of Education. I'm happy to. We'll go around the table starting at my left. Um, you've just been listening to the State Superintendent um, speak. He's the chairman of the board. His name's Brian Whiston. As we go around the table, the co-president of the board is Richard Ziley. He resides in Dearborn. Next to him is the co-president of the board, Cassandra Albridge. She resides in Rochester Hills. Next to them, Michelle Fecto, board secretary. She's from Detroit. Nikki Snyder is the board's NASB delegate. It's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. She resides in Dexter. This year's Teacher of the Year is Luke Wilcox. He's probably familiar to many of you because he's local. He's a math teacher at East Kentwood High School and Kentwood Public um, Schools. And as we go across the table, the governor's representative is unable to join us today. That's Tyler Sawyer. And then next to him is Eileen Weiser. She's a board member from Ann Arbor. She is on her way. Lupe Ramos-Montini, another familiar face um, to you, board member from Grand Rapids. And also on her way is Pamela Pugh. She's a board member from Saginaw. And next to me is Tom McMillan, the board's treasurer, and he's from Rochester Hills. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Now we ask the audience to introduce themselves. We'll start with Sheila Alice, please. Good morning, Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent. Good morning, Wendy Larvitt, <coughs> staff of the State Superintendent Brian Wilson. Good morning, my name is Mark Howe. I'm the Chief of Staff to the Chief Deputy Superintendent. Good morning, Brian Vicker. I'm on with MY.com. No. Okay, Mike Shockmore, Superintendent of Schools, Rockford. Doug Vanderjack, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Rockford Public Schools. Bill Federal Superintendent of Gavin Heights Public Schools. I'm Reader Superintendent of Wyoming Public Schools. Ron Kniff, Superintendent of Ken ISD. Michael Yoakum, Assistant Superintendent of Oakland Schools. Marlena Krolicki, Dean Oakland Opportunity Academy. Brandy Lovelady Mitchell, Principal at Kent Innovation High at Kent ISD. Uh, Greg Dion with the Michigan Department of Education. Favorite Superintendent of Fraser Public Schools. Mike Birdie, Assistant Superintendent of Kenwood Hills. Gerald Hopkins, Superintendent of Schools, Kenwood Hills. Michelle Frenicki, Director of Instruction, Gavin Heights Public Schools. Derek Cooley, Director of Special Education, Gavin Heights Public Schools. Kelly Campbell, Director of Teaching and Learning, Kent ISD. Cindy Counters, Administrative Assistant at Kent ISD. Glenn Fingal, IT Director, Kent ISD. John Krause, campus principal for secondary programs here at Kent ISD. Ron Kaler, assistant superintendent, Kent ISD. Rich Fink, retired teacher. Good morning, Chelsea Martinez, uh, director of communications with the Secondary School Principals Association. <laughs> Stacey Bogard, Michigan Association of School Boards. I'm Marcus Herring with, with TV8. Connie Sullivan, assistant superintendent for human resources and legal services, Kent ISD. Mike Haggerty, Assistant Superintendent for Administrative Services, Ken ISD. Bill Smith, Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Services, Ken ISD. Terrence Longer, Superintendent of Calhoun Intermediate School District. Katie McClintic, Communications, Ken ISD. Joey Walsat, Communications, Ken ISD. Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations. Uh, Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educator Student School Sports, Michigan Department of Education. I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the Director of Public and Governmental Affairs at the Michigan Department of Education. Jennifer Cook, Michigan Department of Education. And we were joined by Eileen Weiser when, during the introduction, so thank you very much. <laughs> public participation. If you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete the form. That's the blue form back there on that table as you enter. Forms must be turned in at the beginning of the portion set aside for public comment, and that will be approximately 1 o'clock today. So if you want to fill out the form and get it to Maryland, we'd appreciate it. 
Discussion items. First item on the committee, the whole agenda is presentation by Kent County Schools addressing top 10 and 10. State Board of Education is happy to be here in Kent County to see firsthand what local districts are doing to help make Michigan the top 10 state within 10 years. And Ron Kniff, the superintendent of Kent ISD, has organized a presentation from four local school districts highlighting approaches that have made a difference in student success. Ron, thank you for being here. Again, thank you for hosting, and it's your show. You bet. Well, thank you. Uh, again, welcome to Ken ISD. We are absolutely thrilled that you're here. Uh, again, Ron Kniff, superintendent of Ken ISD, and uh, it's, it's been my good fortune to be here uh, as superintendent. This is my, my third year. Uh, a little bit about Ken ISD, realizing that some of you uh, may not be uh, as familiar uh, with us as uh, Lupe and others, so uh, just a, a, some quick facts. Uh, we are the fourth largest ISD in the state. Uh, we have approximately 108,000 students. Uh, for perspective, our free and reduced population here is about 45%, which is, I think, fairly close to probably what the state average is as, as well. Uh, we have 20 local districts uh, that comprise our ISD, 23 public school academies that we serve, and we've got everything here. I was sharing with uh, a few board members before uh, uh, we got started today that uh, you know, we have uh, urban districts. Our largest district is Grand Rapids Public with about 17,000 students. Uh, we have suburban districts. We have affluence. Uh, and we have rural districts. Uh, you know, our, our smallest district that we serve is Kent City with about 1,400 students. So uh, we are a nice microcosm of, of uh, the issues that uh, are going on in the state relative to education uh, and trying to make Michigan a top 10 in 10 state. We're trying our hardest here in Kent ISD to make Kent ISD a, a top 10 uh, along with the state uh, with, within 10 years. Uh, before I get rolling, I, I do want to acknowledge and thank uh, Superintendent Wiston for his leadership uh, and the direction that he has provided to ISDs uh, throughout the state and uh, also to our local districts and our local superintendents. It is, it is uh, uh, certainly uh, been appreciated by those of us out here in the field. So, uh, and this is a great example of it, the fact that you are uh, taking your, your show on the road, your board meetings here into an ISD on this side of the state. Uh, Thank you for, for, for coming our way. Uh, but again, we're excited to highlight the great work going on uh, in our <coughs> districts. All of our districts are doing wonderful things, they're doing great things for students, and we have uh, five uh, with us uh, who are presenting their work that embodies the goals of the State Board uh, and uh, uh, Superintendent's wisdom to make Michigan a top 10 state within 10 years. Uh, four of those districts will present during this segment uh, of the agenda and another, Kenowa Hills, uh, will report on their ground, uh, groundbreaking work in competency-based education uh, later on on the agenda. So for our first presentation, uh, we have the Dean of Kent ISD Superintendents with us today, Mike Scheibler, uh, and his Assistant Superintendent, uh, Doug Vanderjack, if you want to come on up now, Mike and Doug. Uh, Dr. Scheibler has made Rockford Public Schools uh, one of Michigan's premier school districts uh, within this state during his tenure. Uh, he's done so by listening, by responding uh, to his community. His Rockford Action model of success engages students, staff, parents, and the community in shaping district priorities uh, and programs and the facilities and is a perfect example of engagement envisioned in the first goal of top 10 10 plan. So, Dr. Scheiber. Thank you. Superintendent Weston, State Board of Education, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we will be brief. I think we have 10 minutes, and we will stay to that. Uh, just briefly let you know, Rockford Public Schools is a uh, suburban school district, over 8,000 students. Uh, we are a minimally funded district, which means you can't get any lower funding per child in Rockford. But we are certainly a highly respected district with a strong reputation. One of those reasons, and you have a copy of this that you're where you're seated is this one. This particular plan is called Rockford Action Model for Success, RAMS 9. RAMS 9 is, acronym is Rockford Action Model for Success. We started this initiative back in 1989. That's when I became superintendent of the Rockford Public Schools. 
So we're on, I'm on my 29th year as superintendent, and by the way, my 50th year as an educator in Michigan yeah. as well. So. <laughs> Seated to my right is uh, Dr. Vanderjack. He is uh, assistant superintendent for HR, but he also is intricately involved in what we do here with RAMS. And he will explain briefly the whole process that we go through to make this happen. As I mentioned, we are on our ninth year, we're completing the ninth, rather, ninth RAMS model. Three year strategic plan for continuous improvement. And quite frankly, this is the reason why we are an outstanding school system, because we do strategic planning. We've been doing it for 28, going on 29 years. RAMS 10 is in the process of being developed, and it will be implemented in January 2018. It takes us a full year to do the planning for each of these RAMS models and so forth, and we use all of these goals to accomplish what we believe. We use stakeholders, input, parents, community, senior citizens, business leaders, students, and so forth to collect our data, data which includes uh, focus groups as well as surveys. And so what I want to present or what I want you to understand on this process is it fits your plan 10 and 10 years. The fact that you need to have stakeholders input and they need to be part of the process as you move forward as a school district <coughs> to accomplish your goals. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Vanderjack, and he'll briefly go through exactly uh, how we accomplish this each, every three years. Thanks, Mike. So the, uh, the document you have in front of you is the final copy, obviously, that takes us a year to develop. Um, the process is pretty straightforward, um, but it involves a lot of stakeholder input as we look through the process. So we have three phases to the process. Um, the first, we start out um, the beginning of the year when we start uh, planning for our, our next strategic plan. Um, and that would be our focus groups. And so our, our phase one is in January and February. We have our focus groups. We have anywhere between six and eight focus groups um, of parents and staff members and students that we work through. So um, it's always interesting to get together with the parents and, and turn a 90-minute conversation into probably two and a half hours of things they'd like to see um, that we're doing well in our school system, um, where they see education going in the future, and some of the concerns they may have. So those are the three main talking points when we have our focus groups. Um, anywhere between 20 and 25 parents attend the focus groups. And I said, as I said, we put all that information together to really get the themes of what's going on in our community, to really know um, what those points are that the parents are concerned about. Sometimes you hear things about penmanship, about writing, you know, kids can't write in cursive anymore, um, screen time, um, how big our school is getting, funding, those are all conversations that come up in our focus groups. We take that focus group information and then we draft surveys. So that brings us into phase two. So our phase two, we'll go through and um, you can see some of the topics that come up. Uh, those are some of the focus group topics that are on the screen behind you. Um, we talk a lot about curriculum instruction, concurrent <coughs> enrollment, drew enrollment, extracurricular activities, safety and security is always, also, always an issue that comes up when we have our focus group conversations and we go from there. When we get into phase two, um, we start to look at a survey. So we take these ideas, we put them together, and we say, okay, um, let's ask our general public now more about, these, more about these topics. So we have a survey created for the, uh, for the staff. It's about a 70 page, a 70 question survey, if you will. Um, for the community, it's about an 80 question survey. And for our students, we keep it a little bit shorter because we want to make sure they get through the survey. So we survey all of our community members. We do it online, which works great, but those that can't take the survey, we make them available in our building that can to take the survey also. We survey all our juniors and seniors. We get that information together, as well as all of our staff. Uh, we have about 1,300 staff members in Rockford. Uh, we get anywhere between six and 700 responses back when we do the survey, which is, which is great feedback. So that's phase two, we go through the survey. We take that information now, and now we go into phase three. So in phase three, we actually have the data and we'll have six or 700 pages worth of information that we break up by content areas. And then our administrative team will break up into the groups that you see behind you. We have curriculum, finance, human resources, all the same groups that you have in the document in front of you. 
We are, our administrative team will break up. There will be about six or seven people per group. And then they go through the data for about two full days of breaking down the data. And the entire time, all they're doing is coming up with the main ideas that they think our community is concerned about. So we start listing them and listing them. And we'll start with, I know from a human resources standpoint, we had about 60 topics on the board when our group first started. We work it down to about 25 points overall. When we have those 25 points, we then present them to the rest of the administrative team. And then the administrative team gets to vote on what the priorities are. Is that a high priority, low priority, not a priority at all? So actually, from our standpoint, that meeting for us takes place next week Monday. Because we've been working on our strategic plan all year this year. So now it takes place this coming Monday when we start the vote. Once that's done, you have the document in front of you. So then it goes into what are short-term, long-term, and ongoing goals. And then during the length of the strategic plan, we as administrators have committees that we serve on to support each one of those goals. You'll notice some of those goals you would think are not a goal that you can actually complete. But it's a goal that we continue to work on. Diversity in the workforce, if you will, is a goal for human resources. That is not something we can complete and be done with. It. That is something we always want to work on. So that's an ongoing goal for us. You'll see different goals that are some that we can attain rather quickly. Boundary studies to see where our district is and where we're growing. Those are the goals that we can work on and complete a study to say, yep, here's where we are, here's where we might need another school, where well, we need to change boundaries from what kids go where, and so on. So that process takes us all the way up um, to November, and then we take it to the board in December for approval, and it goes into effect January of 2018. That'll be RAMS 10 that we're working on right now. So you can see it's a community project. It is something that keeps us focused every through each of the three year cycles that we go through this process. We include teachers, support staff, and parents on these committees as well. So it's a community effort, and, I, and, I, and we try to make it as attractive as possible, as you can see on the document. Uh, we take, I take this to the um, media, multimedia classes at the high school, and I ask the students to come up with five or six renditions of the front cover, and what happens inside, and we've already come close to selecting what the Rams 10 cover will be like as well, once the, it's approved. And, uh, but this, I just, what my intent today and our intent is to let you have an idea of something that works. 28 years going on 29, it works. And it has led Rockford to be, I believe, an outstanding district, not only in our top priority, and that's academics, but also in co-curricular. And we don't call, I don't know something on the screen that was extracurricular, we don't call anything extra. Co-curricular is important. It's important whether you're in the marching band, or you're in the theater program, or if you're in choir, or athletics. It's really important that students participate. And in co-curricular, we have 85% of our high school population involved in some type of co-curricular opportunity. And it's just important. That's the way we look at it. And so, if I don't know if you will have questions, Mr. Winston, or not, but uh, I'm uh, pleased to have this opportunity to present. And I know I had a great opportunity to visit your district and see this in action. So that was very exciting. Questions from the board? Ma'am, please. This is wonderful. I love strategic planning and then the action uh, steps and uh, implementation that goes along with it. So you said that there are 600 to 700 um, responses about what was that as far as a rate? And then um, what's the diversity? of the groups and then how do you make sure that you're able to it, this sort of plan lasts a year <coughs> okay, so how do you and then how do you um, keep up with emerging issues sure so um so first of all going back to the the results from the surveys if you will so our, our staff population because we know they have internet access because we give that to them um, we get usually about 60 to 70 percent turnout, which is great. Our community is quite a bit lower. We have a little over a thousand responses from an 8,000 student population. But for us, a thousand responses provides us a lot of documentation to see where some issues are. Inevitably, we have people that will send us a two-paragraph comment about how their kid was picked up from the wrong bus stop, uh, from a different bus stop. But we have a lot of. 
themes that emerge from those things. So that's really what we're diving into is that amount of data. Um, things that develop over the course of the strategic plan are still addressed, uh, even though they're not in the plan. We've never had a, um, an issue to uh, come up within our community or within our school system that says, you know, it's not part of our plan, so we can't deal with it. We have committees that every year are developed um, from our main areas, from human resources to finance to special education. Those <coughs> committees are driven um, are by the district, but they are developed from the strategic plan, but there's other committees out there that we have. Um, there's a, we have a wellness committee that's part of our committee work. That's not in our strategic plan, but it's uh, some of the things that we still work on. To give you an example, in 1989, when I came to Rockford, one of the first questions on the, our first survey to parents was, would you support a minimally skilled type of competency test in the basic skills in reading and math or a high school diploma? Would you support that as part of our requirements? 97% of the parents responded yes. I ask that question now every three years. The same question, that percent is around 93 to 96% of parents supporting that we require students to pass a proficiency test in math and reading as part of the requirements for a high school diploma. It's in place, it's been in place for 28 years, and it's a requirement, and they get their diploma. And on that diploma, on the, on the left hand side, when you open it up, it has my name and phone number, and the employer can call me and say, Mike, your kid graduated from here, doesn't have the math skills to do a job entry level position. I'll bring that student back free of charge in night school to get those skills. And that's on that survey every three years, and then the percentage is high. All right, Michelle and then Eileen. Yeah, um, so this is great. I, I, I love your approach and um, the consistency of it. So many, so many times districts will come up with a plan and then three years later try something completely different. So I, I love the fact that you've been consistent and that it's so inclusive. Um, I'm, so I'm, um, I've been on some committees dealing with funding, and especially around special education funding. So, um, and some of the instability that affects other, I'm from Detroit, so we have, so I'm not, so I'm trying to see how, what you're doing, if it was to come to Detroit, because um, I'm working with the, the committee on, on um, what is not the same and how, and what obstacles are there. So, um, so one of the issues is uh, with the gap with the special ed funding that we get in the ISDs, um, their village and how much is gone and how it is very diverse across our state where some, uh, but most I, uh, most counties do not get enough special ed funding because of the federal government and the short, short changing us and our state short changing us. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you deal with those gaps in funding. And then another thing in Detroit is that um, the instability is around the charter schools because um, it's so unpredictable. And also with special ed, the, 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 the kids with disabilities go to the regular ed schools. I don't know if you have any charter schools in this area and have been dealing with that and how that works. Um, but also, uh, how, how do you provide really excellent special ed services given that you may have some we have, for example, we have survey questions every three years that talk about special education and special education funding. And we try to educate the reader by the question will have a statement about what you just brought up, that we are not fully funded in special education, that monies are taken out of the general fund to augment what is for funding the education of special needs kids. And so we, we part, make those part of our questions so that the, the reader is being educated about the issue and then responds and issues like that. So uh, two things. Number one, uh, from a strategic plan standpoint, uh, special ed is a component of it. So there are questions that pertain to special education. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I run focus groups. Um, and I will tell you, every one of them uh, has a fair amount of time allocated to questions and concerns because traditionally, those parents are more involved in their um, child's, um, not just education, but concerns that may be going on. Um, we take that one step further. We provide additional surveys and focus groups for our special ed population also. So 
we don't, uh, we can really focus on those issues. And usually it's communication involved with big work, things like that. From a funding standpoint, um, you know, we, we closely monitor not only how we, um, how we spend our money in relation to all the students, but making sure that we provide the services that we need to um, for our special ed population. That the, the um, we don't have as much of a, and we have charter schools in and around our area. Uh, a lot of those students choose to go to the charter schools and then come back, they go back and forth. Uh, we don't have, uh, per se, the, the concern that we're going to lose a tenth of our population to them. Uh, we know there's a certain age where they their charter schools stop, and then we get all the ninth graders, uh, and we go from there. We have a good relationship with them in our area. I think they do a, a nice job of not only educating our students, um, all of our students, but preparing them for whatever school they're going to go to. So I think our situation in Rockford is substantially different than that. All right, we're going to move to Eileen, and then we'll move on. I want to make this brief because we do have to move on. But uh, you just described a phenomenal process that clearly wraps your community and the importance of education. I want to give you just one minute to say what that actually does for your students besides your money back guarantee. In other words, what's the impact compared to other districts who don't have this kind of process that you've experienced? Well, I think the really important part is you're asking people for their input. When I first did this in 89, I got letters attached to the survey. We were not as sophisticated as we are today, with the, as Doug talks about using the, the technology to get input and take surveys. I literally got letters attached thanking me from parents in particular. This is the first time our opinion has been asked. But then through that process of 28 years, they actually see the goals that make it into this RAMS model of each three years are actually being accomplished. And we give updates. I mean, this isn't something that just passed out in January of this coming year, and we're we forget about it. I have updates at board meetings regarding the accomplishment of these goals. And I also have meet with parent leaders and talk about the accomplishment of these goals because they've had input into it. So they're getting feedback on this as we process, go through the process of uh, accomplishing. Nikki, please. Thank you very much. I, I love this. I think what I love about it is that there's a clear framework Shows that you guys have really good values of being transparent and accountable to the process and to the people. That's going to add up to success. So, thank you. Thank you. I love the guarantee. Good work. Yeah, all right. Thank you. I'm sorry, it took. No, you're doing great. This is important for the board to hear. And I, I, uh, I want to be sensitive uh, to your time. I don't want to blow up your agenda, but just so you know, we have uh, th three more to go, and this is. This is, uh, the interaction is terrific, but uh, I shared with our uh, superintendents that they've got about 10 minutes each, so if you want to extend that, that's your call, but uh, I just just wanted to, uh, you to know what to expect on our end. Uh, Dr. Tom Reeder uh, is our next uh, presenter, uh, a true, true educational leader. Uh, the Wyoming Public School District and its demographics have changed dramatically uh, since uh, Tom first entered that school district as a kindergartner. So he's, he's been there for a while. And the strategies deployed at Wyoming... He hasn't graduated yet? He hasn't graduated yet. He's, he's still, still working on that. Uh, but what he's deployed there in Wyoming through the Reading Now Network that you may have heard a little bit about, uh, as well as the literacy coaches that the uh, Michigan Department of Ed has uh, supported uh, through, through the grants, uh, have improved early literacy and they embody the instructional practices described in goal two of top 10 and 10 plans. So, Dr. Tom Reeder. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I am honored to be the superintendent school district that I did start kindergarten with and I did graduate from. Um, I am a first generation college graduate. Um, I have two very large sides of my family, so we have like 140 of us, and I'm about number 80 in the ranking, so it was a big thing when finally one of us took that process. But that also shows the story of Wyoming, because Wyoming was a manufacturing community, and anyone I knew of as a child, their parents were, were involved in manufacturing. So that's one of the big things that has changed in the years within Wyoming. Um, when I did leave for a short while, and I always say it's because I had to find a wife, and it had to be someone out of the community, but um, when I came back, the district was 8% free and reduced lunch. It was 8% um, minority students, 
and 25 EL students. Today we are 82% free and reduced lunch, we have 27% EL students, and we are 63% minority students. So taking that along with uh, five or six major manufacturing plants that probably, in give or take, where about 55,000 people are employed, of which I believe only half of one of them still exists, dramatically changed the Wyoming community. Um, with that comes wonderful challenges and gifts. I'm a father of four, I'm a grandfather of eight, and I have 4,300 children who come every day that I don't look at any different than I do my own children and my own grandchildren. So I believe it's something that is just part of being um, part of that Wyoming community. One of the biggest and most important things, I think, is to make sure our kids have an equitable education and have those opportunities. And I can't sell them short, nor do I want to, and one of the biggest and most key things is being illiterate. And literacy uh, for our students is extremely important. When we were under the MEEP, we were as high as 90% um, in our district. So when I look at what we're doing, I look at the top 10 and 10, and these were the four. I know that Ron and his handout had us down for uh, number two, but one of our biggest things is get us connected with the labor force and businesses in our community and the broader part of Kent County. We want to have implement and assure we have high quality instruction, tier one instruction in every single classroom, reduce impact of high risk factors. We have every one of them you can imagine in our district. I cannot allow that to be an excuse. So my goal is continually knock down any of those barriers to assure all of our kids will have equal access to everything so that they can be the best they can be. Not only when they're with us, but as they go out into the uh, life beyond us. And of course, as Mike talked about with all the things with their parents and guardians, it's incredibly important in an at-risk community to keep your parents and guardians and put things in place to help them as well because they have many challenges in their lives as well and we have to help reduce those. So we've continually put those in place. <coughs> Our efforts so far, we've had literacy coaches for 20 some years. So I was incredibly happy when the state moved towards having literacy coaches that were part of the K-3 um, literacy initiative. And even though they're housed at the ISD, um, we've been linked in really well with them. The piece that is added is a bigger network than rather being a single district. There are some wonderful initiatives at the ISD and the state level where these coaches are being very well trained and, and with a combination of their efforts uh, have made a big difference already in our district. Those coaches are not meant to be interventionists, but what they can do is go in with um, the latest research and provide expertise in various situations in every classroom, K-3, and even in our preschool program. We use them to highly train any of our support people. They model lessons. They do anything and everything to help support the Tier 1 instruction and some of the Tier 2 instruction. Literacy materials. We have literacy libraries. We have taken some of our new 31A money and we are putting $100,000 worth of books in our four elementaries. Um, that was in addition to a grant that we got from a local business in Holland as part of the Reading Now Network, which I'll comment later. The most important thing is for all of our teachers K-12 to have not only content knowledge, but literacy knowledge around their content. Literacy in mathematics is different than social studies, is different than science, is different than art. So our teachers need to teach not only their content, but what is literacy look like in their content? What does writing look like and reading look like in each of those content areas? So we have done an excellent job of getting them pre-serviced with that and to continue with our PD at all levels related to the, the, the necessary piece of literacy. Um, we also do a lot of data. You cannot see it very well on the right. We have our own dashboard. But what it does is it provides five years of data on, uh, I think it's 27 different indicators in our district around attendance, discipline, the five areas we uh, break language arts into writing and reading, science, math, and social studies. And then there's four points within each of those. And it breaks it down by every ethnicity group um, and uh, feature that we want to look at with our subgroups. So I think we're up to 13, um, including uh, this past year we added homeless and our military students as required. So we have a data dashboard so people have information in front of them and when you have a percentage you can roll over with your cursor and it'll list all the students. So if you have challenges you'll always know what they are and we can break it down in multiple different ways. So that's really important to use that data to drive. We ensure our parents, we have done a lot of education with our parents, our EL parents, our regular parents, we run. We do have a wonderful adult ed program in our district that's also supportive of that. And then our last thing, our kids need more time. 
and we are not on a blended calendar. We have started to move that way in Kent County, at least in terms of shrinking some of that summer loss. Um, so I was very supportive of that, but we have expanded day and summer program in every single building. Provide additional time. We have about 1,300 of our 4,300 students who go an additional 24 days, six weeks in the summer. When the Reading Now Network, which I'll also talk about because that helps drive our initiatives and support right now, um, the graphs are extremely important. The one on the left is what started everything. The Reading Now Network came out of West Michigan Region 3 that consists of approximately 100 public schools. And the superintendents looked at this information on the left and said, wow, look at that line. And the line, just for picture's sake, on the right of each of those graphs is the achievement of the students in the vertical column and the horizontal is the free reduced lunch. So if you're on the left, that's, that's a higher achievement, less free reduced lunch. And we said that's just absolutely unacceptable. Um, and, but it's going to take a lot of work to do that. And so all 100 superintendents bought into we are going to support each other. Um, and what we want to do is take that line and not only raise it everywhere, but to take that right side and tilt it so it's as close to horizontal as possible to remove the barriers for the most at risk. On the right, you'll see where we are now. We have moved dramatically in terms of where we are. The black dots are some of our high need, uh, the district, my district. If you see where we are on the left, and we've initiated some of those innovations, we are above. The dotted line is where the norm curve is. That's where you should be scoring. So our schools have moved from below that curve um, and line to above that line. So that's been really important. And then you'll see some of the other districts in the black, which also includes the spotlight schools that were chosen as part of the Reading Now Network initiative. It started out as a Region 3 piece with 100, but Region 7 has also come um, aboard. So it's basically the whole west side of the state. We will share anything and everything around. We do it through MASA. Um, but this is just a big initiative because we need to own that all of our kids need to be able to be reading much better than they are. Once we get the reading, which we are moving in the right direction, we will also be grabbing them. field study team. A team went out and said, wow, why is this happening and then what's happening within? So they went out and this involved uh, 10 of the, I would call, lead academic folks at the ISDs. They visited schools and the findings that came out of that were these schools that were doing out very well, which means they were beating the norm of the schools that were like them. The thing they did was they had an uncompromising focus on reading. You would, the principal knew what every kid was reading at, they, the focus in the building in terms of the amount of time and the effort, there was just this piece. You would never doubt what was going on as far as the literacy in that building. They used data significantly, which I talked about for our own district. They had a shared leadership. Everybody owned it from classroom all the way up, and they had a collective responsibility. It means they owned every child, whether it was reading or a social issue. So the four current initiatives, there's tons of learning that has come out of it. We've run a couple big, huge uh, trainings. We have videos for folks that we share across, and we've tied in with the GELN initiatives. That's part of the coaching network. And we are now principal coaching. We've got lab schools. We've got five that we're looking to preset. That'll be my second to last slide. And classroom libraries, which I was talking about our classroom library. But the big thing is make sure these schools that are high need have a significant number of literacy materials for their students. We just received, as part of a connection with uh, Western, a $12.5 million grant to expand from the five lab schools to be able to go out within the whole area. And we will be able to work with 75 more elementary schools with principal leadership and focus around literacy. We just received word on that last week. So that, that was an absolutely huge uh, shot in the arm with a partnership with several different units within the state of Michigan. And that's 9.75 minutes. <laughs> I, I had a great opportunity to be there when the superintendents all signed on to this commitment. And you could see the shared commitment to really move uh, all these districts. So that was a great opportunity. I saw Richard and then Eileen. Uh, say a little more about the lab schools. What's their purpose or function? The lab schools were schools chosen because they were under the curve. <coughs> So when we took a look at all the schools, 
We did what was called green schools, which were schools that were, wow, you're very high poverty, but you're way above your norm. And then we said, that was nice to learn all that, but unless we can take schools that are way below the norm, and we called them the red schools, and could move them, we didn't accomplish anything. So the lab schools were all schools that were in the red target area and moved them from being a red school up above that curve into the green area. And the focus was those five highlighted areas, which was having a library, an un uh, un a very focused uh, piece on reading, the buy-in from the whole staff. So the Reading Now Network with a set of folks that's come in with coaches and everything to help them move towards that. There, and whether it's a low poverty school or a high poverty school, all five schools that were in the target area have moved significantly. Thank you. Yep. Eileen, on top, please. I just want to say that this is the first time in uh, my current eight year term that we've gone on the road, and you folks are setting a horribly high standard. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I watched a Reading Now uh, Network presentation by Zealand schools uh, back in December before the House Education Reform Committee. And one of the points that was made was that math literacy had gone up at Zealand without conscious intervention. Um, from what you're saying, there's actually a substantial effort to support that. But I'm wondering uh, what you're seeing in all of these different schools, which may not have gotten to the point that uh, others have with professional development across the curriculum. One of the things when they found the green schools, they went in and only looked at reading initially. Um, the superintendents pushed back after the information was given to them and said, okay, they may have done really well in reading, but what did they sacrifice to get there? So we wanted to know what their math, science, and social studies were. All of the schools that were in the green also had substantially higher math, social studies, and science. So it paid off in all of their areas. And it wasn't just about literacy, it was about what the uncompromising belief in all of their kids and what school was supposed to be that they were able to pull off in these sites. Tom, please. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I guess I'm interested in un unintended consequences. Um, I'm glad that there's focus on literacy and it's important. I've seen uh, where people talk about struggling kindergartners, which really concerned me. Uh, I think kindergartners should be playing and, and really, uh, you know, their creativity uh, stifled as le as least as possible, um, and so I, you know, I want to. Do you are these interventions real early? Uh, are there any unintended consequences that you noticed uh, early on and have changed courses throughout these, you know, throughout your program? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm all I'm all certainly again literacy, but is there any is there any uh, it, you know, recess and play, to, you know, for some of these kids, it's important to make sure that we don't just stay focused on one thing, that they they have a broad, you know, that, that, that we have a broad uh, instruction. And so I just was wondering. Uh, that's a good question, and I don't think that changes whether you are a senior. Um, you, you have to enjoy school. You have to have that other part that goes with school other than just education right. driven with the content area. Um, we start actually in the preschool, so I would say in our GSRP program and our ECSC program and Head Start. One of the things is make sure it's aligned. Um, that's part of having standards and, and focus on that. Um, the other piece that's important is making sure when they have a block of time, how are they using that time? So even when we say 180 days of school, my brother used to say, I don't care if you guys go 200 or 170. It's what you're doing with the days you have. Well, the same with our staff. What are you doing with the time you have? So what we have is a 120-minute literacy block. That's an uncompromised piece. We also have a one-hour math block. Then we have two intervention blocks. Now, intervention for one child may be expanded intervention, meaning they're going beyond the curriculum, and for another child, it may be filling in gaps that are not there. That's where you use the data. We also have science associated every day, and we have recess every day, along with the special. Our, our, our contract, or our uh, formula in our district, all of our kids have a special every day. So we have art, music, PE, uh, literacy uh, with technology and as part of their components. So we have not given any of that. I will say from having grandchildren and running through that same thing, I think there's a little bit more of a stress on kids and you really have to focus, but I think that's the expertise of a teacher who teaches K and one to be able to continue that and, and include 
components within their instruction that allow kids to explore and play while also not comp compromising on the, the strategies and things to get them to better to read. And many of that can also happen at home. So that's why that piece with the parents is extremely important. I, my grandkids would love to read. We go to bed, it's always, Papa, two books. So I got to sit with them with two books and we have to go through two books. But there's also questioning strategies that I know about that we need to help our parents. So it's not just about reading with them, it's asking things and doing things that go beyond just that textbook. So that's the stuff we're helping with. Kids love, they're curious, they love to learn. We just got to make it um, not just fun, but bring out the best in their curiosity. Thank you very much. Pam? So thank you. This is another great presentation. Um, appreciate you showing us how mathematically just how you can try to focus on the bottom performing how you can help everyone um, to rise um, the numbers to rise so my question for you and I might have missed this but um, when you selected this as a focus did you do strategic planning around this or did you um, know that this was something that, that needed to be focused on? Did this come out of a strategic No, approximately four or five years ago, the talk began around third grade and the low scores around the state. So out of that, the superintendents within Kent County said, you know what, we need to own this. We need to raise this achievement in our students. That graph started that talk. That graph was around, look at where the scores are, look at how much the effect of poverty has on kids, and how do we help them get there? So by doing that, we set teams to these poverty schools and very high um, scoring schools that were in the green and said, what are they doing that maybe someone else isn't doing? And they, they would sit there all day and script and script and script, and then they would look for themes. You heard that when, Mike, when they were talking about themes when they were surveying. The themes and then said, these are things we saw in all five of these buildings. So whether there was 10% free and reduced lunch or 90% free and reduced lunch, these were things that we saw. These are common. And it's kind of like when you think about the 90, 90, 90 schools and other uh, pushes like that. What is in there that's happening? These were not rocket science things. They were not like brand new things. It was just making sure you stayed on those five as the initial things that really could make a difference. So are you guys, so thank you for that. So are, do you all participate in the strategic planning activities such as Rockford? We, we, we have a core group of individuals that make up part of that superintendent's okay. group okay. within 100, and then we constantly report back to what's called our Region 3 okay. superintendents and the Region 7 superintendents. All right, thank you very much, Tom, yep. for your good work. Good. Keep it up, please. Maybe he will uh, graduate by only one of these, one of these days, so I appreciate that. And, and you know, as Tom said, uh, one of those green dot schools uh, are maybe high performing schools but uh, even within those school systems they realize that they should be doing better and want to improve and so uh, that's that's been the beauty of this network uh, the Godwin Heights School District is our next presentation uh, this is a district that has consistently uh, beat the odds uh, in the achievement of its students during the tenure of superintendent Bill Federoff Bill's learning labs and school improvement work fulfill the expectation of goals one and two of the top ten and ten and is here with his team. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Ron. It's a pleasure. Um, I got the good fortune to have with me some of uh, our team from Godwin Heights. I have Michelle Kernke, who is the Director of Instruction, and Dr. Gary Cooley, our Special Ed Director. Um, Godwin Heights is a small district, a little two and a half square mile urban district uh, that borders in Wyoming, Grand Rapids. Um, it's highly diverse. We uh, are about 60% Latino and Hispanic, and the, the other uh, percentages are pretty much equal between African American and Caucasian students. And generational poverty is present in our district, so it certainly takes a certain individual to be successful to create the relationships with our students uh, and then to move forward with the, the curricular and instructional needs that our students come uh, with the voids. Um, at some point in time, we realized uh, we had a great plan for uh, induction as well as hiring teachers, but uh, as time moved on and we looked at the school improvement planning process as well as some of the evaluation components that are ne necessary today, uh, we, we tried to find a way to marry those. 
so that we can go beyond induction for teachers during that probationary period, move towards enhancing their ability to understand um, not only what great teaching it is for our administrators, but for teachers, and so that we can continue to go ahead and monitor and support them. I think we, you know the evaluation process has certainly moved from uh, being considered evaluative to being supportive, and that's the spirit that we want to carry on. So at this point in time, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to share with you some of the things that we're doing, not only as an administrative team, but as well as a holistic teaching team. Thank you. We're excited to be here and share with you um, kind of a learning plan that we've um, used across the district to push some shared leadership. And I say push because we knew um, if we offered it, uh, people might get on board, but we strategically <coughs> look to be very clear about our purpose and um, share the work of school improvement across the board. Um, as Bill mentioned, our evaluation model has changed and so we moved to a growth stance as opposed to a I got you stance. Um, the school improvement walk that we'll talk about today is, is always non-evaluative and that was important for our teachers to hear, but then to continually hear it and continually be a part of the process to understand that we, we were very transparent about what our goal was. So um, across the top of this chart are our three big ideas. And so you've heard Tom speak about content area literacy. Likewise, that's happening in Godwin Heights as well. All, all teachers are literacy teachers. They may say, oh, I'm just a new teacher of math. But we're, we've, for some time, we've been working hard to help all people see that they have capacity to help in the area of literacy. Um, 21st century learning for us is about the four C's, and in this model it's really about being collaborative. Um, and then sheltered instruction, as Bill mentioned, we do have a high percentage of ELs, and, um, and, and we know that language acquisition takes time, as Bill mentioned, <coughs> and the, the community that we serve also needs some extra time, even if their language, um, their native language is English. So along the left side, we're going to talk about the school improvement walk today. But this chart just clearly shows three different ways that we um, engage teachers in monitoring the implementation of our school improvement plan. So there's three parts to our school improvement walk. The first is a pre-brief. And in the pre-brief, we talk with um, staff and facilitate a clear purpose. Our purpose for the School Improvement Walk is to provide dialogue, a time where all of us can sit and talk together about what our goal is in the plan and, and monitor or dipstick what we see in classrooms. A lot of times, um, for those of you who've been in education for as many years as Bill or Tom, you know School Improvement sometimes is a, a, a document or a binder and you put it on the shelf. Um, when Bill was my principal, I worked through this with him and said, I, I don't understand I'm putting so much time with a small group of people about this plan, and I don't really think we touch it. People don't get it. It's really good stuff. We know this is what the team researched and analyzed. We need to make this better. So for the past few years, we've been working on trying to make that come alive in our schools um, and having teachers really share part of the work, not just the document paperwork, but the monitoring part of it. So again, in the pre-brief, um, we bring up the fact that you, as a member of the school improvement team, carry some weight. You can't just close the door and hope that your stuff goes well. You've got to be able to be a partner, a thinking partner with your peers. And so that means monitoring the plan with us and helping carry the understanding out to all people. Um, a focus for us this year is student talk. So across the district, a goal is to have less teacher talk and more student talk, hence the graphic there with Charlie Brown's teacher. We want our um, teachers to shift in ownership of this work, just like in the classroom, we want our students to share the ownership of understanding content at a deep level. The second part um, of our uh, school improvement process is an observation, and Dr. Cooley's going to talk more about the instructional focus question here and how it leads us um, into observations in the classroom. So as you can see, uh, we focus on what questions, statements, and actions are used to encourage shared thinking with one another, uh, to build on one another's ideas, and to assess their understanding of one's thinking. Um, it's important, like Michelle said, that we encourage the, the uh, students to talk, to continually dialogue, 
Um, as we know, the um, who's talking is learning. Yeah, is the person who's learning. Um, when we look at um, our walks in the adults, the staff members that go out into classrooms, we take three lenses. So of that team, one group of individuals looks at what the teacher is doing, one group looks at what the student's doing, and one group looks at the content that's taking place in the classroom. So um, specifically, we we'll collect data around um, what the teacher is doing related to the instructional focus, so that looks at their practice. What the student is um, doing or saying related to the instructional focus, so this may include interactions with each other, with content, with the teachers, with activities in the classroom. Last question we ask is, what do I notice about the content related to the instructional focus? So an example may be, um, how do the I can statements posted in the classroom uh, tie to teaching and learning uh, that is taking place? Uh, this data um, allows us to collect tangible evidence. Um, although the uh, environment of our classrooms is always um, fantastic, um, it's important that we're um, um, objective with data. Um, specifically low inference data. So we look at um, really when we are in the classrooms we look at three guiding questions which is what can I see, what can I hear, and what can I count. Um, this um, allows conversation to strictly adhere to what was present in the classroom and the facts um, that we observed as a team. As you can see on the right hand side um, we start with low inference data with data collection. Um, then move to inferences, conclusions, action steps, and then the top is obviously the result um, that we'd like to see. So what inferences can we make about our building from the data we've collected from our school improvement walk walks? Um, what can we com conclude? And what, what might be some next um, step, good steps for um, moving forward? Um, so we're careful to define these steps in a protocol that uses noticings and wonderings without call it out, uh, calling out specific <coughs> students you can see um, all of our um, the, the entire process comes back to this ladder or these steps um, and in the end the building team is left with possible um, a possible action plan that might uh, lead to um, increased student achievement um, in some we work at Godwin Heights to keep our process transparent objective um, and based upon um, a teacher and student growth model any questions um, at, at the risk of stating the obvious, it does seem to me that you have not so much a ladder but a circle because in order to determine results you have to collect data and then infer from that data and come to some conclusions. Um, I would agree, it's very similar to the cycle of school improvement. This one? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ali. It's fascinating to me that the special ed um, uh, coordinator is presenting this information. Um, have you, uh, as the students become more involved in ownership of their learning, um, have you seen any differences in what services children need or how they function in the classroom? Um, we are working toward um, establishing a better system of supports, tier one, tier two, and tier three. And so as Michelle and I work closely together, um, it's important that um, what happens um, in a tier one system for general ed students is exactly what happens in a tier one system for special ed students. Um, so what we've learned is that um, good, good quality research-based practice is good for all kids, whether you have a disability or not. Thanks. Yes. Um, Michelle, please. Yeah, um, so when you do the evaluation, would be similar to sort of the teacher evaluations that are mandated. Um, but I, I'm wondering, it sounds like you're being more holistic about the process and trying not to be punitive. Sorry. Um, so I, I wonder if do you, who goes into the classroom and do you use peer review? Um, and if not, how do you judge content if you don't have a content expert? Sure. We'd like to uh, encourage or we still always encourage peer review, yeah. but in our system it hasn't been something we've mandated or said, you know, who can I will do this because so yeah. too. It's very clear that who can I want to work together? Yeah, we can. Um, on our school improvement walk specifically, we have a building principal and a building coach, we call them instructional specialist in our model. And then 
Bill, myself, or Derek, we, we make an effort to be at every single one. We, we've moved from, um, so we have 16 across the district. We have four buildings. So one in Porter is specifically um, planned and facilitated by the building team. Those are modeled after a, a process that we started about three years ago called a K-12 instructional team. And that's sometimes an outside consultant, because you know, we all need a little support. Um, many uh, times it's someone from the ISD here as a consultant to support our work. Um, and then the three of us, as well as every building principal and every building coach. Um, on the school improvement walk, those uh, we ask that district school improvement members to go to uh, one a year, one in their own building and one in another building to, to be able to really see what's happening in other places, other levels. And then we also invite um, teachers of that building to be a part of the walk. So our goal would be every year to bring on more people to see this process to be transparent and clear. It's different than evaluative um, because we're, we're not in the evaluation system. We're, we're just clearly saying, remember we researched this together and we've studied it. And then we learn together, and this is what you're trying in your classrooms. Now let's just see is it happening and to what extent. We realize that teachers are truly going to improve just like students. There has to be a relationship between administration and teachers. There has to be a trust factor. And there has to be some sincerity behind the component is we're here to help you because we know we want you to get better because we know the most powerful thing we can do is put the best folks before our kids. And also, I think it's the credibility of having someone. If teachers, evaluating teachers, there's it's an automatic sort of credibility and trust. And I, I um, so I, I, I'm glad to hear that the, other, the teachers are doing it. I know it's difficult because we have a problem with substitutes and oh, yes. getting people to cover. But I, um, I, I like the idea that you're trying to draw in other teachers because I think that they will listen to other teachers. That that is really the key. Yeah. In response to your um, comment about content leaders, um, yeah. There's no, there's no hiding the fact that the evaluation system changed and the role of a principal is really an instructional leader right now, as opposed to, you know, maybe 15 years ago, we were kind of managers, making sure the field trip bus was ready and I talked to parents and I managed the budget, but teachers went and did. But in the era of accountability, things have had to change. And so we've been clear um, to support our principals to say, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know every single standard and understand the rigor of everything. It's different than when you were a teacher. But you do have to be willing to know the basics and to stop and listen to teachers. And that's part of the, the beauty of um, the new growth model for us is really allowing time to listen to a teacher, ask one question, tell me what you were thinking about that, and then closing our mouth to allow them to talk. Just like in our student or school improvement will allow a teacher to talk through the art of their, their craft. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, when Tom Reeder uh, talked about those Green Dot schools that uh, teams went in to find out what are they doing that is so impactful that's working because they're knocking it out of the park. Uh, some of those schools in Goblin Heights were those schools that teams went into to, to study. Uh, our last presentation uh, is from uh, Godfrey Lee Public Schools. Godfrey Lee is engaged uh, in an innovative design thinking project to redesign teaching and learning to meet the needs of its students, nearly all of whom are economically dis uh, disadvantaged and two-thirds of whom are English language learners. Uh, this may, we had a com brief conversation before uh, the meeting began, uh, Mr. McMillan, and this one uh, might really appeal to some of those questions that you were asking. Uh, but uh, Superintendent Kevin Polston and Dr. Carol Lautenbach will share their work, which models the educational transformation sought in goals one and four of top 10 and 10. Thanks, Ron. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, our story with you. Um, I have a handout that's coming with you just to serve as a, a visual for you um, as we go and we'll reference it uh, throughout. Uh, as Ron uh, mentioned, my name is Kevin Colston, uh, superintendent at Godfrey Lee. And Carol Altenbach, assistant superintendent. And we're going to share uh, our story that, with our learner profile that our Board of Education adopted in June uh, of this year. Uh, we, we're here because we share in your vision to be a top 10 in 10 state. Um, 
our presentation is going to focus on the means to accomplish it, but maybe not necessarily in the traditional way. Uh, to accomplish this outcome, we need to determine all of what we value in education and then identify clear and measurable outcomes aligned to what we value. So who, who are we? Uh, Godfrey Lee is the smallest geographic district in the state of Michigan. We're 1.4 square miles in the city of Wyoming. Uh, we have about 125 professional staff, 1,900 students. About 75% of them are uh, Hispanic and 50% English learners. I think that puts us second percentage-wise in the state to uh, Dearborn. And, uh, by the way, I'm a proud graduate of Dearborn High School. <laughs> That's right. Go Pioneers. 95% uh, free and reduced lunch, 6% uh, transiency, meaning students who are here for one of our count days are not here on the other count day. So uh, fairly significant uh, transiency in the district. It's a, it, an area that has always had strong community support for local funding. Villages and bonds uh, pass in, in Godfrey Lee, even though uh, it is an economically depressed area. And two years ago, we were given the opportunity to think beyond what is to what could be, thanks to a generous grant from the Steelcase Foundation. We used design thinking processes, and through that, we interviewed families in their homes, we interviewed faculty, and we interviewed students and community members to discover what it is that they value in education. A pattern emerged from these interviews, and that was that the school's definition of learning was too narrow, too focused on too few things. So we set out on a quest to redefine what learning is based on what science tells us about learning, a journey that resulted in the adoption of a new learner profile. So as far as how it aligns to the top 10 and 10, we're going to pull apart goal number two. Uh, we have uh, some highlighted words that we want you to pay attention to. On the uh, back side of that graphic uh, are uh, those four uh, concepts that we pulled apart. Highly coherent, child-centered, self-determined goals, and highest potential. As we go through the presentation today, uh, anything that you notice here, see, that aligns to those, go ahead and just jot a, a note. We want to pull back on that um, with our hope that we can see that there's alignment in what we're doing that if we're going to have a top 10 and 10 goal, it can't sit up here. It has to get all the way down to the students and classrooms uh, to achieve that. And, and we hope that we can demonstrate that. Embedded in this goal is are, are words such as strengths, challenges, interested, and well-rounded learning experiences. This goal speaks to who we are educating and calls for our students to have a voice and ownership in their learning. If we ask students what these words mean, or what learning was most impactful that related to these words, you may hear more than standardized test scores. So what might you hear to accomplish this desired state? I want us to look at our current state, and there's a lot of small dots on here, but if you recall uh, from Dr. Reeder's presentation on the Reading Now Network graph with uh, poverty on uh, the x-axis and achievement on the y-axis um, and the scatter plot of schools around the state, uh, this is the third grade reading plot for uh, the MSTEP uh, 2016. Um, as we can, can see that poverty has a high correlation with achievement. Our job is to disrupt that. Our job is to look at the goals and look at those words, child-centered, uh, highly coherent, self-selected goals as means to disrupt that. As, as Dr. Reeder mentioned, the Reading Now Network has used this graph for the impetus of their work to really see are we getting the return that we hope for or are we just doing what the data says we should do. We want to outperform that. We want to disrupt that. Research says uh, poverty accounts for a one year's learning deficit. And when we think about our, our traditional way of doing school, we've about maxed out what our current paradigm can allow. Small tweaks and more efficient use of resources can incrementally improve that. But in terms of transforming this graph, as Dr. Reeder um, alluded to, um, tweaks may not be all we're looking for. If we think about uh, when the uh, school calendar that we use now was uh, implemented, uh, the 
current the means of long distance communication that was the telegraph. Uh, we uh, we stopped using that. Um, and if we think back as as recent as 1999, Blockbuster had 10,000 stores. Um, we had the best telegraph possible in the 1800s. Blockbuster had the best video store possible in the 1990s, and changes made them obsolete. And so we need to look at education through a different lens if we, if we significantly want to transform what we're doing. So as a result of the design thinking process that we did, uh, we began to research what could be. And uh, we found this book, a 2016, uh, a fairly recent book. Uh, the subtitle of the book is probably the most interesting part. It's what science tells us about raising su successful children. It's a book actually written for parents. It's not written for teachers. It's not written for schools. It's written for parents. So these learning scientists, Roberta Glinkoff and Kathy Hirsch, summarize what practices and structures are aligned with brain science, and they created the matrix that you have in front of you, which we're calling the six C's of learning success. We've developed a really strong partnership with Kathy and her team. Uh, Roberta has some uh, life uh, things happening right now, so she has not been very interested, but she's been following along with the progress of this partnership. And our team from Godfrey Lee has met with Kathy and her team uh, once in person a number of times uh, uh, by video. Uh, and uh, later in October, we have a team going out to Philadelphia to meet with her and her team as well. Uh, Kathy is also coming here to the ISD in November uh, to uh, speak with the, uh, the superintendent. So uh, this partnership uh, is, is very exciting, just beginning. Uh, they want to learn alongside us as we begin to implement the six C's of uh, learning success in our district, and they want to help us learn what to observe for. I hesitate to use the word measure. What we don't want to do is turn the six C's <coughs> into a checklist and a rubric of uh, things to check off that students are uh, accomplishing. We really want to understand uh, students and how they develop confidence. How do they develop uh, at those higher levels uh, of the learner profile? In addition to that, we're very interested in knowing how teachers fall in the profile. Uh, we look at school as an ecosystem where the teachers and the students are interacting together with each other. How do students and teachers work together to develop a student's confidence as well as a, a teacher's confidence? Lou Glazer of Michigan Future Inc., and I think you're familiar with him, uh, he has pointed to, to the ideas in this book a number of times and the work that he has, has done uh, is having uh, merit for a model of education that pushes beyond uh, what is to what could be. And uh, NPR did a, a nice feature as well. Uh, Michigan Radio had a, a feature uh, on uh, becoming brilliant as well. So we're very grateful for, uh, for these two uh, partners and their teams uh, as we begin to think about school uh, and success differently. So if we were to look at a graphic of those six C's and maybe the influence or the attention that we uh, put on them, I, I would say currently there's a disproportionate um, factor uh, placed on content and the size of the words uh, you know, is, is showing that here. Uh, it, it, I believe it's that way is because that's what we can really quantify. We can really, uh, or what we think we can quantify is, is content. Um, but just because we, we can't necessarily, um, at this time, you know, use quantifiable measures, uh, doesn't mean that we don't still value these. So if we start um, as a strategic uh, planning model may, may start with what's important to us, and then let's wrap around all the other tools and instruments to, around what's important. So the, the profile uh, is in front of you, it's, it's, it's on the screen. Um, it, it demonstrates, I believe, that we are always teaching kids, not delivering content. This construct is true for every child every day. It's not a left to right progression or continuum. As Carol mentioned, it's an ecosystem for how we work together and influence each other. Uh, kindergartners as well as you know eighth graders and seniors can achieve at the at the highest levels of this um, construct it, it's, it's not meant to progress you know through levels by age uh, it's, it's more of a construct for framework uh, for what we hope our schools can be about that it may look something like um, where uh, all 
of the six C's uh, have uh, value, then I can make an argument um, that confidence may be the lever to pull to, to influence the others uh, more significantly. Um, I, I want to make clear, though, that what I'm not asking is to be let off the hook for outcomes. That I believe that if we implement this construct with fidelity, our students will achieve no matter what metric you place in front of them. And so in this time where we're trying to uh, identify what are those next steps, we, we shouldn't let the, the fear of necessarily unknown or what maybe we can't measure at this time get in the way of doing what we believe students value, families value, teachers value, we certainly know employers value these things as do higher ed. But how did we get here uh, is, is critical in our story. So we're going to show you a brief uh, video, uh, it's about a minute and a, a quarter, and as you watch it, uh, if you would look at the back side of your learner profile chart, um, and look for, uh, this is a video about our district and our journey uh, with design thinking, thanks to uh, the grant from the Steelcase Foundation. What do you see uh, expressed in this video that aligns with those four uh, disruptors, as we call them? Uh, so we'll just play the video and then we'll uh, process a bit afterwards. Students go home on occasion and say to their mom or their dad, I don't know that it gets any better than what I experienced today. Whoa, who else did that? Um, what did they try to stop it for? What was the reason? That's the specific persuasive element that you were using for this body data. Classroom teachers on occasion will go home and say to themselves, I don't think it gets any better than what it did today. But human-centered design is attempting to do is to connect those, it doesn't get any better than this, days for students, for teachers, and for administrators. A structured, repeatable, disciplined approach to getting to know the community and all the parts and pieces and people that are involved in the community, taking the time to get close to those people, understand who they are, what drives them, what the barriers and challenges are, and then you can come up with amazing solutions or evaluate current solutions and deliver something that is effective and makes sense for that particular community. We all have a stake in this. Human Centered Design does a great job of bringing those stakeholders together to answer the question, how do we really want to create lifelong learners? Okay, you can just go ahead and stop the video right there, please.
And last, you heard about uh, being child-centered. Um, these are elements of uh, activities that happen within our schools that are child-centered. Those weren't featured in the clip that you saw. Those are featured uh, later on in the video. Um, and I, I'd like to focus on uh, one of those, especially uh, KSSN, Kent School Services Network. Um, we're a district that had, uh, was the first, I believe, in the county to have Kent School Ser Services Network in uh, all of our buildings. So each building has uh, services from KSSN. And KSSN is a countywide support system that brings health and human services into our school buildings to serve students and families at no charge to the families. If we believe there's more to student outcomes and standardized test scores, then we must believe that the conditions for learning are critical. So every school at Godfrey Lee has a coordinator to provide case management for students and families, and also a clinician that provides social work services, as well as DHS workers. We fund our portion of KSSN through uh, state funds, 31A funds, and KSSN is an integral part of our team, so it's part of that highly coherent system, a partner in every way in educating and supporting our students. With the district-wide support of KSSN, our students are able to become confident learners who have the support needed to develop in all areas of the learning profile. So we started today pulling apart those elements of goal number two, highest potential, highly coherent, child-centered, and self-determined goals as disruptors to what we know influences our students' uh, outcomes. We also showed the graph on how poverty has a high correlation with achievement. We also know that students that are English learners also have uh, barriers uh, to achievement. We also know that social emotional factors can make learning difficult. But here's what we do know. Research and learning science tells us that what schools do matters more than what all those factors I said impact education. And so when we think about if what we do at school can make a bigger impact than those factors I mentioned, then we ought to be chasing a more equitable world so all of our students uh, have an opportunity to go where they want to go, that we shouldn't accept the status quo, that we should defy expectations, and we do this, we accomplish this uh, through one relationship at a time. That's us. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. First of all, I want to say it's fabulous. Um, uh, but uh, we had a presentation from a school district closer to Detroit that was relying fairly heavily initially on uh, uh, non-federal, non-state funds outside money to make change. And I know that you have I had some assistance in that. Uh, the first question is how much of, uh, how much money has it taken to get to this exploration point? And the second one is um, what do your classrooms look like? Is it project-based project -based learning? Is it traditional instruction? How do, how do things actually look, and is every classroom different? Well, great, great question. So uh, Steelcase, again, uh, gave us a very generous two-year grant to really explore design thinking without any predetermined ends. We, did, we had no idea where what we were discovering and learning was going to take us. This is where it took us. So uh, that process, uh, grant funded, was, I believe the first grant was 250000 uh, for, for two years of, of study and work uh, uh, to just learn what, what it was we wanted to, to do in order to transform learning. Through that process, we have funded a number of opportunities for teachers to teach in new ways. Uh, through project-based learning, we, we sponsored summer camps, we called them this summer. They were uh, uh, open to anyone interest-based, uh, based on what students wanted to learn during the summer, and then teachers uh, uh, signed on to, to teach those, those summer camps. Uh, we've done uh, a number of um, initiatives such as outdoor learning, uh, so that's a big emphasis in our early childhood center. We actually, uh, right in the middle of a, a, an urban area under consumers energy power lines, we had a green space that has been uh, converted into an outdoor learning lab. So those weren't directly related to the grant, but they were certainly part of uh, this emphasis on redefining what learning looks like. We haven't yet said what the hows of learning look like 
we're, we're working together to determine what the what's of learning are. The why of learning, we're pretty clear though, has to be aligned more closely with what we know about the science of learning, about what motivates kids to want to learn. And we think uh, the learner profile and the ideas in, uh, in this work will help us help teachers discover that over time. So if I could just do one follow up really quickly. If you were looking at yourself as a 10 year transformation plan, what year are you in now? Oh, like five year? <laughs> I don't think, to say that you ever get there, I, I think is artificial. I, I think what we're doing is a, a cycle of continuous improvement. And, and you know, so when you ask, what do your classrooms look like? You know, do they look like this? Look, I mean, my answer is yes. You know, they look like probably all of those things. You know, because we're all on that on that journey. Um, I think the heart of what you're asking is, how can this be? How can this concept maybe be applied in other ways? Or is is are there barriers such as the grant funding? Uh, design thinking um, isn't that far removed from what you heard Dr. Scheibler talk about with the strategic planning process. You're starting with empathy by going directly to the people you serve and identify what's important to them. And then you start wrapping around programming, services, you know, outcomes aligned to what they are identifying as important. So selfishly, we're just looking at how the heck would something wonderful can go to scale in other places yeah. and what the cost is. And obviously this journey that you're on is going to be wonderful for the parents and the children and the teachers in your district. But we want it someplace else too. So you have to come back in a couple of years. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's, that's part of the work we're doing with, with Kathy and, and her, her team uh, to, to determine how, how to uh, quantify this uh, in ways that, that make sense. All right, we're going to go to Lou, Dr. Z, and then move on. So Lou Glazer came to speak to the board two months ago, and immediately thereafter I ordered the book, and have since read it, totally on board with the philosophy of it. And you know, you mentioned that you had the graphic where content represented the biggest uh, idea. And, and I think we all know that the reason why that's so emphasized in schools is because of the high accountability that we have right now for individual teachers and for schools. And so that accountability is driven by standardized tests, which therefore, if I'm a teacher, I'm gonna make sure that I'm covering that content. I'm gonna put a lot of focus on that. So my challenge to the board and also to you as a district that's really trying to do this is to think about how we can shift uh, that priority for teachers, right? And, and one of the ways is that you know, you talked about we don't want to measure. Well, maybe we observe or measure. I don't know what it looks like. But somehow, uh, the teachers have to see value in the other five C's. And if they see the value in the other five C's, then you'll start to see that outcome happening within students. But I also think that the board needs to think about how we can approach those other five C's. Uh, because the decisions that we make here have a significant impact on what actually happens in classrooms. And what actually happens in classrooms right now is what's being measured by standardized tests. So I continue to challenge you to think about how, how, we can, how we can make that a part of the, of maybe a part of the evaluation process. And I think you heard um, Gavin Heights talk about student talk as a priority because that's a high lever to pull for student engagement. And so when we think about you know, how those other C's can fit in with how do we engage students in learning, if it's relevant, if it's meaningful, if it's personal to them, then they're gonna be more engaged and they're gonna learn more. And, um, I wish there was a, I wish I had a great answer to your question. Uh, you know, if, if we did this, this presentation would sound different. Um, you know, but I think the fact that we believe that it's worth chasing, and we believe it, it's worth the resources, and it's not just us. Um, you know, there's, there's other folks um, across the, the country that believe we need to take a close look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, and, and I think just the fact that we have that awareness is going to lead to uh, improved outcomes in the short term until we can figure out how to do it in the long term. Thanks. Dr. Z, then one question, please. It really strikes me how class oriented this theory is. When you think about the structure of learning, the most basic learning, learning a foreign language, you don't start out with meaningful stuff. You start out with unmeaningful gibberish. You go through a, if you're learning a classical language, two years or more of a tedium before the activity becomes self-rewarding. What motivates you through those two years of tedium? 
In traditional education, it was do this and you will live. Okay. Um, so survival rather than joy was the motivation. Um, you're dealing with a population that has special challenges because this learning theory arises from the middle class where the transition from the child of a professional into the life of a professional isn't nearly the journey that it is for the child of a blue collar uh, or an impoverished child uh, into the totally unknown life of the professional. So you've got two entirely different journeys and you're using a theory that's geared towards the, the shorter, easier journey rather than the more difficult one. That's, that's my reservation as I, as I listen to this. Um, Child-centered instruction, you presented as if that were a new idea. That's what I was taught in education classes back in the 70s. That idea has been a currency of the last 100 years. And to introduce it as something novel, um, I don't know, it makes me wonder, what, what have you been doing the last 50 years? And we got, um, the last two sets of, of curricular uh, standards that Michigan has adopted have been explicitly based on skills rather than content. Um, I was upset with the department when they introduced the new set of standards and as if it's sh it shifting away from content with something new when actually it's been educational orthodoxy for the last 50 years. There are other theories that I like, like uh, Edie Hirsch's uh, cultural literacy who argues that the converse is what is needed, an emphasis on content. This is what gives students from non-English uh, background and, and uh, minority background uh, the vocabulary, the, the literacy to be able to participate in the culture on an even, on an even basis. Um, I wish you well, but, but uh, I'm, I have some concerns about the theoretical approach. And, I'll be very curious to see how things go. I think the 60s are an important work in terms of preparing kids for success and of course how the teachers do it in the classroom. You know, that's key. So I think you're doing you are doing some good work and we just we'll see how it all goes. I think for us it's an and not an hour. Okay. I I will finish this um, comment session. Uh, with something very, very positive. First of all, we're in West Michigan. We're in Grand Rapids, and that's a state board, and that makes me very happy. Now, one word that you used in your presentation was joy. I was in the classroom for 36 and a half years, and that was the key word, joy. If a, if a child uh, is learning, if he feels safe, if he feels his dignity is intact, and he feels respected, he's going to learn. And all your presentations here today, we use that word, joy. And, and I am overwhelmed uh, to sit here and listen to your presentations. All of us are doing the best job that we can. All of us are doing something positive for those lifetime learners. Uh, and to get them out in the, in the world and be productive citizens. The reason why well, there's doctors right now, there's lawyers, there's electricians, there's everything is because of us. Because of us educators. So it is happening. We are educating our students. And I am thrilled as a, as a teacher, as a principal, and everything else, uh, to hear all these positive things that are happening in classrooms because teachers want to be elevated, elevated for what the work that they're doing every day and it is great to hear what you, uh, your messages were today. So I thank you. I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for the presentations. We appreciate it.
Brian, if I could just uh, quickly, couldn't, couldn't say it any better than that, but I do want to just uh, let you know how much we appreciate here at Ken ISD uh, your opportunity to, to come here to West Michigan and taking advantage of the opportunity to come to West Michigan. We applaud you for your service uh, and uh, we thank you for allowing us to share. Uh, Kevin said it uh, well too, that we share that vision of top 10 and 10. Uh, we got a little bit of a snapshot in terms of what we're doing here in Ken ISD in terms of working towards that. Uh, but uh, and I know there's a little bit more on the agenda coming up here soon from Kennewa Hills as well. But thank you for allowing us to share and thank you for taking the time to learn. Thank you for the work. You. Next item on the committee of the whole agenda is a presentation on competency-based education. Mm -hmm. Competency-based education and personalized learning systems are gaining traction around the state and around the country. This presentation will provide an overview uh, by the Michigan Department of Education along with some local districts on the work that they're doing in competency-based education throughout the state of Michigan. Linda Forward uh, from the Michigan Department of Education and others are, will be coming forward for this presentation. Get everybody on your table. So I, I, I just, and the chair's open too. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. All right, Linda, take it away. Thank you. Good morning. We're delighted to be here. We want to um, spend some time this morning uh, sharing with you uh, some work on competency based education that's going on around the state. As uh, you are aware from your agenda, we also have uh, some criteria for a grant that the legislature has provided to us, and we want to share some of the information on that as well during this presentation. We want to share with you what competency-based education is and what it isn't, because it has a reputation of perhaps being kids in front of a computer pushing a button, and at least the people we brought in here today don't see it that way. So. We thought it might be best to have some of the practitioners from across the state share with you what they're doing in their districts and their ISDs. So um, with that said, if I push the right button, we'll move on. Nope. Yeah. There we go. Um, so first of all, I just want to ground this in uh, our top 10 and 10 initiatives. Do you see that blue band up there, learner-centered supports? Competency-based education fits very nicely with several of those initiatives. For a student, to be able to learn, you've heard it from this earlier presentation this morning, they need to have the supports that are personalized to them. Children are different from your children, different from my children. They all need a different, a different, a differentiated set of supports to learn the knowledge that we would like them to gain. They also need to have that learning personalized for, for them. I share frequently at this group uh, stories about my grandson. He is definitely a kinesthetic learner. If you could find a way for him to move, to learn, he'd master everything in very short order. Having to sit and read, not exactly his thing, although he does it. Um, also, we want children to understand the content well. How many of you learned something for the test, and um, six months later it was gone? Maybe even three weeks later it was gone. And so in order to really understand what it is that we'd like them to learn, we need to get into a deeper foundational experience for them. And we think that um, this competency-based process is one that will benefit students across the state. Greg and his team have been working on this for some years now. You'll remember that the governor gave a speech about anywhere, anytime, any place, at any pace. And so at that point, the team started working on what was out there, what was happening. And so they've put together some foundational concepts that we want to share with you today, share with you the experiences that some of these districts are having with competency-based education, and then give you a little insight into what the grant is asking for, because we see that as sort of a petri dish of things that can happen for all of us to understand this a little bit better. So I'll turn this over to Greg. Thank you. So if you look at the screen here, you'll see a uh, policy scan that my neighbor did. The one on the left is from 2012, and the one on the right is uh, very recent, from 2017. And the color's a little off here, but you'll notice if you start from the top there, um, and please don't try to read the text, uh, the red is kind of the more advanced states, uh, green being that uh, next level, and then there's a, a yellowish color. And essentially what we have here though, if we look at um, what has happened around the country, we see that 
Michigan <coughs> is not the only state having these conversations, and that in fact many other states are looking at competency-based education as a solution for supporting students where they're at and providing um, providing better services for students. <coughs> Uh, Michigan, uh, from 2012 to 2017, has remained an emerging state, although I would argue that given the recent legislation, um, we would be moving into uh, the more advanced levels of implementation. Also, uh, given the fact that we have uh, good local control, we have the Michigan Merit Curriculum, and we've been to many seat time waivers that allow us some flexibility, I think, um, that have have made it possible for some of these models to kind of flourish throughout the state of Michigan. So here's the question of the day, what is competence? And there are kind of two accepted um, notions of how we talk about competency, not just in Michigan, but with uh, some of the other states that we've worked with. One is that state of being or having the ability. So a student is competent in the content. This gets us away from uh, the notion of social promotion to grade levels or uh, letting a student skate by with a D minus. Um, so that, that notion of competency or proficiency. And the next is the things or the demonstrative set of knowledge and skills. And by that I mean, for example, sets of um, content standards that may come from different subject areas that are naturally um, kind of collected together and students are able to demonstrate what that competency is. So it's a higher level um, demonstration of knowledge and skills that students can demonstrate. And I have an example of that that I'll share in a moment. If we look at the literature um, and what we've seen in the research, uh, in the top of this table you'll see that there are five components that are very broadly accepted, uh, again within Michigan, but also um, across the country and within other states. And I'm not going to read those, but those are, those are kind of the main components that we see in not just the literature, but this is what we're seeing emerge in some school districts across the state of Michigan. Some uh, may be specializing in one or two of these components, uh, where others might be kind of taking on all five. And then on the bottom of the table, I've included the definitions <coughs> that have been developed here in Michigan for these three components. One is the personalized learning, so well, that's that student level or the learning that takes place with the students, noticing that within those components, things like the pacing being variable, and again, that students advancing is based on proficiency. Next, we move to the personalized teaching, which is that instructional delivery. And that's the collaboration between the student and the teacher. Uh, there's flexibility in how the instruction is delivered based on the student needs. And then this concept of student ownership, which is not new, but is really emphasized in this model. And then the technology, we have actually kept out um, <clears throat> intentionally because we know that you can do, uh, you can have personalized learning, you can do personalized teaching without technology. However, what we're seeing is that if you leverage the technology, you're able to do it better and really kind of take advantage of the tools that it provides. So defining competency-based education in Michigan, um, the, the things that I just shared are kind of those working definitions or their components, uh, but our plan here now is to develop a more definite definition uh, of competency-based education in Michigan. We have uh, brought together a steering committee uh, that is going to meet. <clears throat> We're going to look at what's out there in the research and literature and best practices develop our definition in Michigan and then share that out for some feedback. And this chart I just used, and I'll, I'll leave uh, you for a quick second to kind of look at it, but we think about the traditional system, and this is the one that I went through, uh, K through 12, and then we look at this competency-based system. It just provides a little bit of a comparison about how the two are different. So instead of just participation or being in class, the credit is based on proficiency. Pacing, again, is variable, and students move on when they have uh, mastered content. We're looking at reporting around learning objectives or targets, so not just end of course grades. 
measuring what students know and can do compared to just what they know. And then also being able to honor that learning that happens outside of the traditional school day. And how do we then transfer that back into our reporting systems for our students to let them move at their own pace. And then Linda mentioned um, what competency-based education is not. And these are just kind of some of the, um, the myths that we hear about at least or that um, come to our attention. One is that it's strictly online courses doesn't mean that there aren't online courses, but it's, it's based on what students need at that point in their life or their academic career. So it's not just strictly those online courses. Um, the other is that um, we've heard that it's a way to replace teachers, which I think the examples we shared today will illuminate that it's actually probably opposite of the case. And the third is that it's a program or a thing that you can kind of purchase and just implement in your school. Um, truth is that it's a, it's a system and it's much more than that. So this is just a, an example and um, there's a lot of text here. I don't share this to um, see who has the best vision, but just to show kind of what we mean when we talk about breaking down a competency <clears throat> from, uh, from the standard. So, in this illustration here, if you start on the right, you have elementary school, middle school, and then all the way on the left, high school. And you notice we have just five circles in elementary, four in middle school, and three in high school. So these are very high level competencies. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this one right here in a little more detail and just see how it breaks down in terms of the assessments and the competencies and the standards. Uh, the intent would be at some point to provide some models for all content areas that schools and districts could use so as they implement in terms of uh, the state and uh, other stakeholders providing supports, they don't necessarily have to do uh, this heavy lifting on their own. But this is what was in the circle on that box in the top, which is outlined. Demonstrate the ability to interpret, analyze, and build functions that model real-world phenomena. And so what we have underneath that as we work our way down, we have those summative assessments. So there's a way that students demonstrate that they can do that, okay? It doesn't have to be a paper, paper pencil test. Um, it doesn't have to be an online test. It could be a combination of things. But there's that summative point where you really um, determine whether or not students are competent in that content. And then as we move down um, to what we call these interim assessment blocks, you'll see those blue squares there, uh, linear functions, quadratics, for example. Um, that's another level. So. As you move down from there, you get eventually into the standards. But in this example, let's say a student learns linear functions in their CTE course. Okay, we can represent in our reporting systems that student know, students know that content, allow them to move on. So we don't have to re-deliver, if you will, that content in the classroom. So we're calling this the big ideas, and again, this is just a model. This is not something that, of course, would be mandated by the state, but in being responsive to the requests that we've had from school districts, um, this is one of the things that we've been working on to help illustrate what that looks like. Now, I mentioned the student ownership, and uh, these are, again, I know that the text is small, but just to give you a visual, so if we look at that transcript on the left, and uh, it's hard to see on this screen, but there are actual links in there. So a student can take this transcript, an employer or higher ed institution can click on those links and see more about the course. So that's more advanced than the one I have, which is kind of probably a microfiche at this point. Um, but then if we move to the right and we talk more about this um, ability to have an interactive report for students that's updated in real time, we see how much richer it can get. And this is kind of that top layer. So that next layer down would be where you get into actual content for students. So as a student, I could go share this with a potential employer, and they can see exactly what and what I can do and how I've been able to demonstrate that, perhaps. So we've got things in here. The academic components are in here. Um, some I've seen with examples like the 21st century skills that folks have um, added. You know, the things that uh, the workforce tells us they're looking for. So, you know, are you punctual? Can you work well with others? Some of those other skills can also be represented in this report. <coughs> things like your interests, awards that you received, um, recognized digital badges, those kinds of things can all of a sudden uh, provide a really good uh, indication of what students know and what they can do. 
And this personalizes that reporting system then for the students. So the next question is always, well, what about colleges? What are they going to do when they receive this transcript? Um, and this report is just an example of what we've been hearing, and this is consistent um, with what I've heard, at least working with the admissions officers in Michigan. But basically what they've told us is that they get transcripts from literally around the world. Uh, they get some that are narrative. They get some that are from public schools, some from private schools. They get some from homeschool parents. So they're kind of used to seeing a variety of different transcripts. And it wasn't that there was concern about the competency-based um, transcripts. They actually thought that it provided them with more uh, critical information. Um, but there's probably going to need to be some correspondence there about what the reports be. And then the next question is always, well, what about the workforce? In 2014, we held a summit where we brought together K-12 educators, uh, members from different sectors of the workforce and intermediate school districts, and have a conversation about career and college readiness. And it was the workforce partners that really kind of pushed us toward this conversation about competency-based education uh, because mm -hmm. they indicated that the traditional transcript did not give them a great idea of what the students knew or what they could do. So uh, these conversations aren't new and actually have just kind of developed out of a response to those kinds of things. And then the, the, uh, the figure on the right there is just an example of uh, industry recognized digital badges for a cybersecurity company. So this is an example of how competency-based reporting fits into other sectors. Okay, so we have three examples to share. Kennewa uh, Hills, Fraser Public Schools, and Oakland Schools, three kind of different uh, approaches. They're going to share uh, some information about their journey, so I'm going to hand it over to them. And um, I think Kennewa Hills, you were here for uh, a top 10, 10 presentation uh, at one point as well. So it's good to have you back. Yep. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Board of Education. And thank you, Ms. Ford and Greg, for uh, the nice introduction. Um, we're proud to be here today to give you a little bit of a snapshot of our journey that we've been on for the last several years surrounding our uh, study of competency-based education. And I applaud the Board of Education for, uh, for having conversations surrounding this as well. Uh, I thought we'd start with, like Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. So uh, as Greg has kind of alluded to, I thought I'd turn it over to Dr. Mike Birdie. He's our Assistant Superintendent at Kennewa Hills, and he's going to share two slides on what is competency-based education as it relates to the work that we're doing at Kennewa Hills. Great. So just to set kind of the baseline, uh, how we approach competency-based ed, there's three key um, key factors we look at, knowledge, skills, and dispositions. Um, knowledge is that low-hanging fruit for a lot of districts beginning in this work because that's the, those are the things we deal with on a daily basis with our content standards. Uh, I would say the shift to skills and dispositions and lifting those up are, uh, I don't want to say unique because we've been doing that for years, but monitoring those and measuring those over time throughout a student's educational experience. I think is somewhat unique. So skills are simply the strategies for learning. Uh, collaboration is something we focus in on at Kennewa Hills as a key lever within that area. And then dispositions are simply your behaviors that contribute to learning. Things like uh, grit's a popular word, uh, persistence, leadership. But again, a note on that slide is a lot of districts engaging in this work initially start with, um, with knowledge as that initial starting point. Next slide. Um, but we feel it's also personalized learning. Um, so competencies and personalizing this work walk hand in hand, and I think they're codependent. And what we mean by that at Kennewa Hills is we, we like to focus on our learner pathways as time being a variable, um, and also really concentrating on the zone of proximal development. Because we know if we can get in a student's EPD, we can accelerate learning. Um, so again, at Kennewa Hills, we call it personal mastery. And again, it's that personalization and competencies walking hand in hand. So to give you a little bit of a glance, uh, a glance at Kennewa Hills, uh, one of the things that we quickly discovered in our journey is that uh, competency-based education is something that can be applied to all demographics, to all size districts. So here's a, a few bullet points about Kennewa Hills, but the important thing with that is 
Uh, in our study that we found that competency-based education exists in districts of 500 students and districts of 50,000 students and de demographics of 0% poverty or 100% poverty. Uh, there, there's no uh, box in which you can put uh, the demographics associated with when competency education works. Uh, so and we are right here in Northwest uh, uh, Grand Rapids uh, and so this is a home to us. Uh, to begin with, we studied, uh, when I started seven years ago at the Kennewood Hills, we, we confronted some hard truths, um, some realities. And uh, one of the things that came about of that is our ISD uh, commissioned a study of engagement of, high of secondary, specifically high school students starting in ninth grade. They did this over two years, and I put these up here as just some examples of what we found as we pulled data out of that engagement survey of our students. We, we, uh, this survey uh, affirmed what we already knew about students at the secondary level and, and their lack of engagement, their lack of interest, in, and that's oftentimes why they ask the question, why am I learning this? Uh, another thing that we looked at, in, in addition to the engagement, was how our students were doing in the classroom. And uh, to our surprise, we found that after just one semester at our, in our secondary levels, grades six through 12, one in five students had experienced a failure in a class. 20% of our students had experienced a failure in class. Uh, when we dove even deeper into that, we found that one in three of our students were uh, earning a D in class. Uh, now that is alarming to us, it's probably alarming to you, but it's, it is a reality of all of, it's a reality of what public schools face, uh, what all schools face uh, today is that uh, students are what, not engaged and they are uh, not meeting the demands of rigor of the classroom. What is even more alarming is when you ask students why, what it was, why you earned an F or an E in algebra, they couldn't explain. They couldn't, they, they didn't know why it was. Parents didn't know what it was, where those deficiencies were, and that was because there's a lack of understanding what the competencies that go into those areas. So, uh, and it's not a failure of our teachers. Our teachers work hard each and every day. They do a phenomenal job, an absolutely phenomenal job. Our instructional leaders, our building principals do a phenomenal job. We found that it was a failure of the system to support the teachers and our, and our principals and how we could uh, what we need to do to correct the system. So we uh, started with, as Dr. Scheibler did in Rockford, we started with uh, uh, surveying our uh, stakeholders. We had a community survey where we sent it out to over 10,000 households in print and also encouraged them, if they didn't want to do it in print, to do it online. We surveyed all of our students, every single one of our students at that point, about 3,100 students beginning with our kindergartners, and yes, they can give you some valuable input on what they believe is needed in their schools. We surveyed our staff, our uh, parents, and local business officials, and we asked two key questions. What do students need to know if it's successful in 21st century, and if needed, what should we change with our system to make it better for them? And that's where we, that's, we did that to uh, uh, develop our strategic plan. Uh, when we got that information from our stakeholders, we decided that we needed to do a lot of homework associated with it. So they're telling us uh, certain things. What do we need to do to change our system? And we started with a book study on the book Delivering on the Promise. We did that with our, piece, uh, with our uh, uh, leadership team uh, and with our Board of Education. And from that summer in 2012 with our entire school uh, instructional staff. Uh, again, the book was Delivering on the Promise. We found that, it, as you probably are sitting here today, that it's very, it, it's kind of vague. It's, it, we know what school's like in a traditional setting, but what is school like in a competency-based setting? So we went on field visits. It's something that businesses do all the time, where they study uh, things by going places and learning from other folks. We did that by going to Lindsay Unified in California. We had a team that went there. We had a team that went to RSU2 in Maine. And we had a team that went to Highland Tech. Uh, again, to be the eyes and ears of our school district to bring that back to our state to our uh, staff uh, and then from there we developed ad hoc committees after an in-service with our instructional staff to really key in on some of their concerns some of their questions that they have and one of the proudest moments that i've had as a superintendent of kennewood hills is our commit vote that we made on on april 26 of 2013. we knew that we needed a 
over 80% of our instructional staff to be in support of continuing our conversations in, on this journey in order to really make a difference. And on that day, 81.2% of our staff said we want to continue these conversations, these bold conversations. We don't have all the answers, but we want to continue learning about it and, con and continue to put the pieces in place to move into a competency-based system. Yeah, so one of the things we relied pretty heavily on in Kennewell Hills, and we're going to probably speed things up a little bit because we have a, about a three-minute video towards the end that we'll, 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 uh, we'll share things a lot better than Jerry and I will. Um, we, we use Marzano's High Reliability Schools framework uh, pretty extensively, um, and that shows you the, diver, the different levels leading up to a personal mastery system, and, and he refers to it as a competency-based system. Um, one thing to keep in mind here, this work isn't linear, it's organic. You don't check the list off as you move on and forget about the level. It's a continuous improvement cycle. Um, but I would add, it's really hard to do a competency-based system if you don't have those first four levels in place with your curriculum, with your reporting model, especially your instructional framework, and obviously a safe and orderly environment foundational to all of our work. Um, just a quick a uh, snippet of our timeline, we began in 13-14 with our staff professional development, really keying in on school culture and climate and, uh, and bolstering that. We moved to step three in Mar Marzano's framework uh, the following year, which dealt with our guaranteed viable curriculum. And then, candidly, <coughs> we, uh, we hit a realization where we knew we needed to make improvements instructionally. We needed to have a common instructional framework, K-12, so we could speak a common language on what effective teaching looks like, regardless of level. Um, in this past school year, we began implementing our learning management system called Empower. And then finally, this school year, which is the next slide, um, almost done. And I've never seen teachers work harder. Instead of the traditional sage on stage, we have teachers acting as guides on the sides where they have to know where each individual student is at in terms of what they know and what they don't know. And they create an individualized plan for each of those students to make sure that they are experiencing success and mastering what they need to know before going on to the next level. You no longer just worry about teaching a chapter or teaching a unit. You use that as a guide, and then you have to make sure you're planning and preparing for all of your other students uh, and meeting them at what level they're at. So, a really specific example in my room right now for teaching is numbers, adding them with uncommon denominators. And I was able to look back at where my students were in fourth grade, and I have been who were not able to add and subtract mixed numbers with common denominators. So now, having that information, I can pull those groups and I can do some filling in of some holes that they had last year so that they are ready, now that we're talking about it as a fifth grade standard as well, to build on. I use technology a lot in my classroom. I have it as a way for students to give directions as to where they need to go next. The whole time, freeing me up so that I can pull small groups my entire math block I spend working with kids, kids that either need to be extended or kids that I need to assist with whatever topic we have to be on or maybe fill in some holes that they have from before. So I use technology as a way for them to see once I've accomplished this, this is where I go next so that there's no waste of time. They have, um, if you will, their own individualized plan as far as what they need to do. And so here at Central, we see that engagement in about as many different ways as you can name. So in reading, for example, students have book boxes and they are doing whatever the competency is for that day, but they have a book, back, a book box that matches their own level and they're reading at their own level to master whatever that competency is. In math, they might receive uh, different manipulatives or they might go on a computer to um, see a lesson from a different teacher that's going to explain it to them in a different manner and all of a sudden they walk away and say, oh, that's what they meant. <laughs> we need to be at something that 
we we needed to learn. Usually as a class, it's usually like it's usually only right to one person, and um, it's usually higher or lower for the other people. And I like it because it's right where you're supposed to be. <laughs> It's uh, certainly encouraging to hear so many school districts talking about uh, really developing students, student-centered environments. And so in Frazier, we certainly have been on uh, a very similar journey. If you're not familiar with Frazier, we are over in Macomb County on the east side. Um, even though I began my teaching career in Belvey, uh, I think as Mike did, uh, love West Michigan. Uh, the east side has been a great place to, to work with kids and families in our community. Um, we're about 5,000 students in the district. Um, about 1,800 of our kids are schools of choice. So they come to us, it's a pretty high percentage, they come to us from the districts around us, um, and it's really program driven. Um, they're there for the programs that we're offering um, to our, our kids through our school district. About 40% free and reduced lunch um, as well. Um, we have been on this journey for quite some time. I, I came to Fraser from Rochester Schools where I was the technology director um, for the school district in 2005. And in 2005, when I walked in to greet the staff, um, I wanted to send out an email to say hello and introduce myself. And I was informed at that time that the, the teachers did not have email or computers in 2005. And so from that point to where we are today, our staff has gone through a tremendous transformation. This quote by Stephen Heppel has been one of the quotes that we really have um, caused ourselves to kind of stop and think about the death of education and the dawn of learning. And for us, it was really um, one of those tipping points in the late 2008, um, nine, where we were talking about, um, we really had two choices. We can choose to uh, be concerned or, or be victims about what was happening in education and public schools in particular, or we can choose to control our destiny. And as a staff, to their credit, they really came together and said, listen, we want to take back the conversation on education. In fact, we, we almost, uh, pretty much formally banned the word reform within the district because we believed that it began with a negative connotation. And instead, we really focused on redesign, reimagine, rethink. No different than any other industry. We knew we needed to go um, down that path. So for us, we, we had a firm belief that it wasn't that our schools were broken. It wasn't that we what we were doing was, was wrong for kids, but we knew we needed to rethink and, and reimagine how students, every child, was going to be given an opportunity to be successful um, within our school district. I think you all know this uh, pretty clearly. Our kids are very different today than when we went to school. And the question is whether or not we as a system have transformed to the point where kids are connected to their learning. We all know that teachers are everywhere. Um, if you have to learn something or do something at home, generally we'll all go to YouTube pretty quickly um, to try to solve that. That's a teacher. That's somebody anywhere in the world can provide that information to us. And so as a school system, are we developing models that allow us in, in a system that allows our kids to access those teachers anytime, anywhere? And so for us, when we, we got to the point of really talking through personalized learning, we realized pretty quickly, and even through a couple of bond issues, where we became a one-to-one -one district, and, and this year we've rolled out MacBooks for every student at our high school, and the technology has been fantastic. But what we realized is it's extremely difficult to personalize learning for every child until you get to the point where time is not as fixed as what we've made it. Meaning, right now, a big reason we have grade levels is what year you were born. And I understand the socialization, I understand the power of a cohort and being able to move through school um, with your, your classmates, but it, it is not an indicator of where a child is at based upon proficiency and mastery in their academics. And so for us, our over, overarching goal was to personalize learning for every child on a daily basis. And we knew we had a shared belief in the need to create a system that would allow our kids to progress based upon academic proficiency 
And it's incredible to watch students as they go through their learning progression that when they get freedom because of achievement, um, how much more their intrinsic motivation goes up um, to be able to succeed and push themselves. And often you'll hear a kid say, um, I didn't realize how fast I could go until I, I had the freedom to go. And that's a powerful comment to us as the adults and as the leaders in creating that. We also know, as you're hearing today, pretty solidly, that there's this renaissance in learning that's taking place. This isn't about adult-centered conversations and what's happening with teaching. It, this is about learning. What's going on with learning right now? There is a learning renaissance that is happening. And how we respond to that with the kid in mind is incredibly important. And so for us as a staff, um, we knew that we were committed to it. I have a couple of slides, and I won't go in deep detail on them just for the sake of time, um, but this will give you an idea of our journey. When we really began digging into um, our transformation process, we knew that systemically we had to um, look at what our current practices were, and we referred to it as organized abandonment. What were some of the things that we needed to stop doing so that we could create space and time and capacity of our staff to be able to begin doing what we needed to for the kids. And so you see the instructional transformation. Um, like so many have talked today, we relied very heavily on our strategic planning process. Every three years, um, we go through that transformation. We do a lot of individual um, learning as a team and as a board of education. Um, so that process has been very systemic across the school district. But you can see in the summer of 2015, we really took a deep dive with the competency base. Um, we have focused our instructional design around um, Erickson's work around three-dimensional learning with content skills and conceptual learning um, to make sure that we're still giving strong foundational, but also getting into the higher order thinking. Um, what we found through a curriculum audit was um, most of our work was at the retrieval level. When we went and visited classrooms, we found that um, we were giving kids work that was single answer, almost a Google solution um, type of work every day, and then they would get to an assessment, and it required a much higher order uh, thinking, and our kids were not prepared. And so um, we quickly realized that we should not be shocked by the results that we were seeing. Um, in particular, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Fraser High School. I have a video um, that will take up a portion of my time, but it'll give you an insight to what's going on uh, with our kids and the flexible scheduling. For us, we began with hybrid courses in 2010, and the hybrid course in Fraser is uh, teachers, and they self-police on, on which courses are approved. Administration is not really involved in that, um, but teachers will submit uh, proposals to have courses part on, online, part face-to-face, -face, and they determine based upon the course syllabus when the kids will be in the classroom and when they'll be um, able to be on their own time at home or at Panera or wherever they want to be. That really launched um, a, a culture within the building of understanding that learning would take place anytime, anywhere, and any place, especially at the pace um, that we were seeing. Um, but that transformation for us moved pretty quickly. Um, it is happening K-12, um, but you can see in the lower right-hand corner that our goal is um, we want a flexible environment. We want to um, have students move on when ready, quite frankly. If you've demonstrated proficiency, we need to set you free. And part of that is to also make sure that um, they have the opportunities when they get to that last year, junior year, senior year of high school, that if they want to go into an early college program, they can. If they want to get into a work-based experience, that they can. But the biggest part of it is, can we create a system around competency base that has students demonstrating their mastery and then moving on at their own pace with student agency, voice, and choice as a major part of that. So um, I have a video that I'd like to show. I think it's queued up. There we go. This will give you an insight to our anytime, anyplace. a challenge. They provide a fun learning environment. They provide all the stuff that kind of gets me motivated about school and makes me want to go there. I feel like my students are jumping at a challenge now. They are ready to accept challenges. They're not afraid anymore. I think they know that 
we're there to catch them if, if need be, but they're able to soar when they can. They give us more opportunity to challenge ourselves. It's nice because I have such a small class size that I'm able to spend a lot of time with my sixth graders. I'm able to spend individualized time with them. Some students like to go farther ahead in the lesson, dig into the next lesson, they're ready to tackle it. Well, others might need an extra day or two, and those would be the students that I pull, have a little intervention group, and then catch them back up. If you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing as a junior or senior, and you don't need that time anymore, it's a way of kind of incentivizing kids to be on track, but also gives us ideally smaller numbers that we can work with of kids who do need to be here for that time. I have the option to go home, to work on what I need, or I have the option to stay at school, and so it is like my responsibility and making the right choices definitely builds on that. <clears throat> found that it doesn't work anymore to stand in the front of the room and teach to all students because not all students learn that way. We can like teach each other, oh you don't know this, oh well, I know it and I can teach you too. They have absolutely done everything like from the teachers to the opportunities to the doors that they've opened for me to the countless amount of awards and scholarships. It's been great. They've just outdo themselves. So one of the programs I just want to talk about really quick, um, through the Innovation Council, and we were so fortunate um, that we were able to receive um, flexibility in our pupil accounting um, for our students. You saw the students that were walking up and with, handing their student ID. Um, the system that we set up, and we actually wrote the software within the district ourselves, um, they walk up their student ID and it immediately ties into our student information system. It checks their grades, but more importantly, it goes in and verifies that all competencies have been met within their classroom and that they have above an 80% in each of their courses. It also checks their behavior record, that if they've had no issues in school, a green check mark will come up um, on the computer and the kid is able to leave and to go where they want. The parents are immediately notified via a text message and an email that your son or daughter has just left the campus and they're off and, and going. Um, when the kid comes back, they scan back in, same email text message goes off to the parent so the parent knows, okay, my kid is coming going. For our community, that's a huge shift because in 05 to 2010, we didn't even have open campus to go to lunch. So for our community now, they understand that learning is going to happen in a variety of places and that this, the role of the campus is going to change very significantly. And our whole district is only two miles by two miles. It's a very tight community, but they understand now that the role of Fraser High School, the role of our middle school is going to be very different as our kids progress and our community needs evolve with that. So we feel like we're educating two generations at once and we're trying to also show our parents it's going to look very different. Trust us, it's, it's a, a safe, secure environment, but also for the kids of saying you have to own your learning and you want freedom, there's responsibility and accountability that goes with that. Thank you. And our last presentation is uh, Dr. Marlena Krolicki and Dr. Mike Yoakum from Open Schools. Thank you, and thank you uh, for your patience as listeners. You've been hearing some amazing uh, presentations, and uh, just bear with us for one more. <laughs> uh, and uh, the program that we are presenting, the model that we are presenting today, is Oakland Opportunity Academy, which is an alternative high school in southwest Oakland County. And uh, we are uh, pleased to present this as a model of competency-based education. Uh, not that we started from that, but that it grew from the need of the individual student. And I think you'll see in the things that we present that um, those are going ahead. Um, the, uh, the model that we have uh, won us an award, but it's really um, the kids that we serve that are uh, the reason that we come to work every day. And I wish that we could have filled the room with uh, some of those student voices because it's really, um, it's really their achievement that makes it so remarkable. 
want to give you a little bit of context for the program. <clears throat> we think it's important. Of course, we're an ISD, so we're a regional service agency. This started a little over seven years ago when uh, six of our districts in the southwest quadrant of our county asked us to put together an alternative education program. That was actually in the spring of 2010, and we opened the doors in September. So it was very quick in planning and, and starting the program. Uh, this evolved, this quickly evolving model uh, started uh, with some, uh, some present uh, available resources, which was the Career Technical Campus. So we are located in one of the Oakland County Career Tech campuses, and that made um, kind of the, that's the seed that uh, we grew from. Uh, Competency-based education was really always a part of career tech, so the way we grew our academic courses was really very much like that model. Actually, I would have to tell you originally, originally the seed would have been that we would have had more online learning self-contained. That worked for about a day and a half until the, uh, the kids uh, rejected it soundly. And when your um, alternative high school kids reject the model that uh, you are presenting, you don't have to wonder about it. Uh, they were wonderfully uh, vocal about what was not working. So we began an instant revision on what we have to do. So, what, so we had to start with the learner, and that is exactly, this is kind of a, a Zoom thing. We went right down to, what does this student need? Well, of course they and the districts that are sending us need um, not only career tech, but uh, the hands-on learning, but they also need those core academics because they're working for their diploma. That is their end. Um, this required us to uh, create uh, an individualized, uh, self-paced learning plan and that self-paced aspect really continued to drive the way the whole program has uh, grown. Uh, not online, but a blended instruction model because the, the students that we are serving, it's essential that they work with uh, an educator that is, that is working with them and coaching them. Not as much in the uh, specific uh, uh, context of the course as it is in getting them motivated and keeping them focused and making them um, refocus on their goal and then dipping down into what uh, the essential reteaching pieces are for them. Uh, the, the curriculum is integrated in that our English uh, classes work with the science and the social studies and an amazing aspect of what we do that we'll explain as we go forward is uh, more adults, more teaching adults working with them uh, as tutors. Uh, and in the last uh, couple of years, the um, social emotional learning of our students has become undeniably important. And so we have an on-site social worker. And Henry is the therapy dog who is probably the best staff member that we have. In the individualized and self-paced learning, just to explain that a bit, um, every student uh, is given and developed a plan of work as they come in. So the Sending High School will uh, show us what the student needs. And uh, I will meet with the student and the parent if they are available, or their guardian, to say, what is it that you need to finish your high school diploma? What are the academic courses? That's the easy part. But the conversation then is what worked and what didn't work. Because we don't want, we cannot repeat what didn't work before. We've got another shot at getting this young adult prepared for adult community life. This is it. How can we engage you? Um, was it that they couldn't get up uh, early in the morning and they missed all their early morning classes? Well, that's great. Our, our school goes from 1.30 in the afternoon until 8 p.m. Was it that you uh, weren't ready and you didn't do your homework? Well, that's great. We don't have any homework. It's just that you can do all your work at home. Um, was it that your, uh, your anxiety really disallowed you from even coming to school? We address that in their social and emotional health. Um, and their engagement that we've talked about in all of the presentations is really wonderfully addressed with project-based learning. And the kids 
this year talk to me about the projects that they did last year. They know it. They remember it. And I'll be darned if you could ask any student uh, if they remember their uh, chapter test from last year. But boy, do they remember their stress unit. Um, this is a uh, sample of the student plan of work, and that, that's really the map for every student. So we keep it in a big binder outside of the office, so they always have tactile access to it as well as electronic. That old tactile crossing out the uh, course when they complete it and uh, re, uh, refiguring their current uh, credit total. It's amazing. And the kids come back and they just, they'll just they just stare at it as though they hope it will kind of magically change. Uh, but uh, they have access to that. Of course the teachers do and they know exactly where the students are going. And uh, the parents do as well. So uh, no more mystery of, uh, I think we said earlier, it doesn't matter what grade you think they're in. It, it, this, is the, this is what really matters. And putting those courses together, so I mentioned that um, English is taught in, uh, in collaboration with science. The teachers work very closely, and or social studies, or, or Spanish, any of those, to make sure that those competencies could be combined in the particular project that the student is working on. And the, the kids love it. They are absolutely thriving. These kids are thriving on it, and these are the kids that would have been almost an assured dropout. Um, I think uh, we have mentioned before this all emanates from the core curriculum. And remember that we are serving the graduation requirements <coughs> for ascending schools. So, uh, of course, when we say they have uh, finished the requirements for their English, science, social studies, etc., that is based on the core curriculum. We've already mentioned uh, the great collaboration that uh, science um, and social studies do along with our English teachers. And um, this is worth noting that the, the teachers are teams. So the harmony within the teaching staff is uh, fabulous. They are really good friends together. They work together. This is, uh, this is real serious teamwork, which of course uh, allows the, the culture of the school to continue. Um, and Mike is going to speak some more about our work as, uh, with tutors in our academic programs. And uh, the project-based learning, and I think I've touched on that, and I mentioned the stress unit, it's absolutely amazing. The kids did a unit where they took their own stress levels, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their breathing. They talked about the things that, oh, by the way, what do you think is the biggest cause of stress for our kids? Sorry, everyone here in the room. It's school. <laughs> by far, that's the thing that caused them the most stress. So then what uh, could students do to remediate that? They did all of the, the charts and the graphs and the metrics on what um, the things were that managed to lower their stress. Breathing, uh, a nature walk, um, yoga, all of those things that might work. And they managed to bring their stress down because guess what? As your stress comes down, then you can focus and concentrate more in the Let me talk a little bit about the model in more specifics because I think it will help you understand um, what exactly we're doing. It's a very integrated approach. We have the, in every classroom, a uh, team of teachers. And in English language arts and social studies, we team. And English language arts and science, we team. We didn't do that in mathematics intentionally because almost to a student, when they come to us, they have no credits in mathematics. And they're <coughs> typically juniors, often seniors. So we have to get them through four credits in mathematics and mathematics-related courses in order for them to earn a diploma. So we treated that one a little bit differently, but in the other areas, it's very integrated, very project-based. <clears throat> I'm going to tell the history of this a little bit more to show you the difference between competency-based education, personalized education, and some of what some people sell as competency-based or personalized education. We inherited a model seven years ago <coughs> that I would call program instruction. We had kids on computers taking their courses. All of the curriculum, the instruction, and the assessment was through that program. At the end of the first semester, we had about 120 students. We did not have a single student 
pass a single credit in a semester. So we got together and we created the program that we're sharing with you today. And it involves uh, each of the elements that we're talking about. It's based on um, heavy emphasis on personalization, on establishing relationships, and finding ways to create student engagement. But we also knew that in order to get these kids through to a diploma in the time that they had and how deficient they were in credits, we needed to create a different kind of classroom environment. So in any classroom, there are a minimum of four certified teachers at any given time. <clears throat> we have a big advantage in that we go from 1.30 to 8 o'clock. So what we've been able to do is have our lead teachers, but also bring in certified tutors to be in those classrooms at the same time. We call them tutors. They're really doing instruction the same way the teachers are because they're certified in the subject area that they're, they're working in. Um, we left this till the end, and um, Mike warned me, don't go off too long on this, because to me this is um, the, the whole heart and the reason that the school is able to exist, um, and it would be a presentation by itself. But it's that uh, positivity of the culture that allows the whole thing to work, and without that, um, that's the most important software that runs the school. Um, it is about respect for self, others, and school, and we remind the kids that constantly. Um, it is about um, the attendance, behavior, and coursework, which you might recognize as the early warning system. Uh, and when I meet with the students and the parents, I put the attendance times the behavior times the coursework equals D, the diploma. They like that, and that's pretty clear. So they know that that's what it is. Uh, Po continuous positive reinforcement uh, from all of us uh, to all of us that uh, it is a very kind and a positive school. Um, if you were to hear the uh, student videos uh, as they graduate, they all speak to that, um, that kindness, that positivity, and that help that they get. Um, reflective behavioral interventions, we were actually even doing that before the state law changed in August. So that uh, certainly works. And I have alluded to uh, the social and emotional uh, learning for our students. There's a reason that our kids are behind the credits. Um, to be a trauma-informed school is essential for us to be able to operate and function. Um, this, is, this is our data chart. And uh, you can only see that we are going and growing. Um, we uh, graduate, and it varies because of the, we have a continuous enrollment process, and if they come in with three credits, they're not going to finish that year, of course. It's going to take them a fifth, maybe even into uh, that sixth year. But again, that's all self-paced, and I think our previous um, examples uh, explained, once they kind of catch on to that, they really start to go and grow, and they're in charge of their own learning. So. We're really proud of the graduates that we have. We make a big uh, fuss about them, and they can graduate from their sending school as well. So we just want to finish by saying one of the things I think hasn't been said explicitly, but has come through not only in each of these three presentations, but a lot of what we've heard earlier this morning. Approaching education this way is about motivation. And we have a very serious problem with student engagement. Competency-based learning is highly motivating for individual students. When I was a very young teacher, I don't, I'm afraid to say one, but early 80s, I read Benjamin Bloom's The Two Sigma Problem, and he talked about how do you get a growth in student learning of two standard deviations. And he said the way you do that is one-to-one. -one. Through what would look like one-to-one -one teaching through mastery learning. I started teaching that way back in the early 80s. Everything in the system was against it, except two things, the parents and the students, who loved what they saw happening in the classroom. We tell the students at OA there is no failure. It ends when you turn 22. 
<coughs> Until then, we're going to keep working with you to make sure you master the competencies and the standards in the Michigan Merit Curriculum, and um, that will be the end point. So thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, thank you for your
Uh, if I, you know, the interesting thing is when, when we had conducted our site visits, I mentioned going to the different places across the country. It was a, quite a privilege. The one thing that we left with is uh, that it looked, the, the classroom looks very much like the classrooms that we that you see in a very traditional environment. So the, the notion that students are on computers doing, you know, and the education is personalized in that, in that manner is, is farthest from the truth. I think that's where the misnomer is. So that if you came into our classrooms uh, each and any day, um, yes, our students are privileged with having access to computers, but that's not where the instruction occurs, and that's not where the learning occurs. Uh, it's a, it affords them an opportunity to see what the curriculum is on a path. It's very transparent, so they can see where they are and where they need to go. But it's, not a, it's not a matter of how we deliver the, the content, the course, the, the curriculum, the instruction, and so forth. So, um, but I, certainly a fair concern because sometimes I think that that gets lumped into the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I, as a legislator, I visited an EAA, and that's all they had. I walked into every classroom, they had a bank of computers, and that's all the kids did was probably get to the next competency mm -hmm. and check off. And they took the test 12 times until they got 70%, and then they moved on. I mean, so uh, that's where. And I'd be done wrong. Just, just one more thing to add on. Our teachers are ultimately the gatekeeper for competencies, and that's through examining a variety of data points. Computers at Kennewa Hills will never be responsible for whether or not a student's competent. It's our highly trained staff that are gifted in that. Yeah, and I would just say um, I, I share the concern of, of how this gets implemented. Um, authentically, it is, um, it's not about technology. It's about mastery. It's about students being able to be proficient and I know that we use those words. Um, it's, it's important. We need to make sure that every child has their own path, and the technology supplements it. It does not supplant instruction in the classroom. And so, and I'm a tech guy. I mean, that's my background. But I will tell you that the, the driving force for it is, uh, as a parent, when we talk to parents, do you know my child? Do you know my child well enough to know where they're at academically in each of the areas and is the rigor at a point where they're going to be successful, whether they go college or career? And for us to get to that point, um, our staff, and I will tell you, for our teachers, and we had a very traditional um, teaching staff who have transformed themselves into learning facilitators through this process, they now will tell you that the spirit of a teacher comes alive because they're seeing student engagement go up, they're seeing uh, classroom activities much more relevant and connected to the student learning. So it's, it, that's part of the culture shift that we see. And it's not just with us, it's, it's happening in higher ed. The importance, you talk with employers, you talk with CEOs, the competency is a word that comes up on a regular basis. Are they proficient and are they prepared for the environment that they're gonna walk into? The technology supplements, it does not supplant. All right, I have Eileen, Cassandra, Michelle, and Nikki. Eileen, please. Well, I think that's a perfect lead into what I was going to suggest, which is that we do have a responsibility on this board to be skeptical and to question and to make sure that um, something that is being proposed for even one school sure. is going to work, uh, or that school probably shouldn't be teaching that way. So uh, we can't force anything on Michigan schools. All we can do is to pass the message along. And I would love to see us at one of your schools um, to visit, if you, could, if you could find a way to accommodate us. Because seeing how it should be done well makes us the best messengers for quality. And I think that if we balance that with what we know could go wrong, we're better off than not knowing what, what is being done well. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Cassandra. So I'm, I'm glad one of the things that today's presentation focused on was content, because that's always been my fear about competency-based education, is that um, a competency ends up being something like, can you write a paragraph? And yes, students can write a paragraph. They can write a wonderful introduction. They can write a wonderful conclusion and have three points in the middle. And the content is completely moronic. And so you know, at that point, have they satisfied a competency, or have they not? And that's always my reaction to when I hear the word competency-based education is, what competency are we talking about? Um, because we're told we live in a post-fact world, but I still happen to believe facts matter. And you need that foundational understanding of history and science and uh, social studies and things like that. And if we're moving into these competencies, 
does that, do those facts get lost in the can you demonstrate to me that you can do something? Um, and so that's my, my concern. And then my question for you is, we talk about competency-based education so that students can advance faster, but what about those students who don't advance fast? At what point do you have to rethink and say, maybe this is not the best thing for these kids? Well, let me answer the first part of that. Um, that's partially why we separated off mathematics. So when we looked at it, we said, we know that we can integrate social studies and language arts um, based on the content standards in the state curriculum. We know we can do that in science and language arts. In mathematics, we wanted to be very careful because the research shows that when you integrate in mathematics, often you lose the important mathematics understandings that you want students to walk away with. So we kept that separate. Um, that there are times we do projects that are very mathematics based, but for the most part we separated that out until we know better how to do that, the way we can do it right now in English, language arts, and science or social studies. But those content standards aren't lost. Competencies just bring in other aspects, um, like dispositions and some of the things that have been mentioned earlier. And I would just add, in regards to the students who may struggle a little bit more, um, in our current model, they move on no matter what. And they move on with holes in their learning. And we keep moving them on because it's the end of the semester. It's the end of the school year. You're, you're now in third grade, whether you were ready or not. And so for us, um, and it's especially important with our, our special needs kids to have that additional time, to have multiple means of engagement, multiple means of expressing what they know, um, different paths to their learning, and to have the time that they need to develop that comprehension. And as I mentioned, ours is wrapped around the three-dimensional piece, which is the content skills and conceptual learning. So we, there's no sacrifice of the need to know. We still need to know. You still have to demonstrate proficiency with the content as well. But we also need you to do higher order thinking and to be able to apply that, that content as well. But it, it, I guess that's my question though. At what point do they age out of that system? And, and if they haven't satisfied those competencies, what happens? What, what does that look like? Well, in the, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. In the go current ahead. model, the, the age is, is all, you're always racing against the clock anyway with kids that are, are struggling. Right now, I believe with the competency, what we're seeing is we have many more parachutes and interventions for them because we know them better than we've ever known them before in regards to strengths and weaknesses. In kids, it's incredible when you talk to a fourth grader and they, they can tell you what they've mastered because they have such a deep understanding through the I can and I, I will statements, they know they're learning at a much deeper level. They also know these are my gaps. These are the things that I need to work on. And, and you can really focus in on that. One of the teachers in our video, and when she talked to Ashley did, she talked about how the classroom design is very different. This is an instructional design challenge as well. The cemetery seating of kids in a row is no longer working. That blended model where you're rotating, and I can take a smaller group because maybe the three of us are at the same place in our learning, and I can work with this group. Meanwhile, this group is a little bit further advanced, and they're working independently, or they're working together as a group. Um, that's, that's a different design for the classroom, and there's only so many minutes in the day. But we have this convergence of the technology and the software and instructional design where we're finally talking to the kid about, where are you at? in your learning, not we're the 30 and then we'll shoot to the middle. It's a very different model instructionally. And that's been the biggest lift, I think, for our teachers. But I would tell you, and Frazier is a very strong teaching staff, very strong um, union environment, and they have embraced this conversion because they see it as that opportunity to take back their profession around instruction and what's doing what's best for kids. Michelle, please, then Nikki. Would you yeah. like to see? Yeah. Um, so my question, uh, well, and first of all, I wanted to say I had the same sort of skepticism as I too saw the uh, EAA in my school. Mm -hmm. The content that was put was launched onto these platforms was highly questionable. But people said if you questioned it, you were anti-technology, and that was not. <laughs> it was just anti-bad um, education. So, um, so 
I, so that, that was my introduction to this anytime, any place. Mm -hmm. So that so that it, it like all these red flags instantly arise sure. because I can see that it can be done on the cheap and badly. So um, so my question was though, in what is it, see, so mm -hmm. I'm imagining a classroom with a teacher who's told that they have to have individualized for every child. And that's a heavy load. And depending on how many children that teacher has to individualize their instruction and know well. So what is the basically the optimal uh, load that a teacher has um, in these individualized instructions? Do you have guidance on that? Do you adhere to that? Um, so, so I'm just, and how do you afford that? Because it sounds like you're going to have to do it well. You're going to have fairly smaller class sizes. We've not changed our class sizes um, throughout the whole process. We had very specific targets depending upon kindergarten through sixth grade and then to the high school. And we've not allowed those um, to blow up, so to speak, in regards to the numbers. It is, the, the challenge is how do you um, differentiate for every kid? I think the data that we have now on every child, we know more and we can be much more surgical about the interventions than trying to shotgun and say, I know that I've got a group of strugglers. And I, I know very specifically what Dave needs, I know what Jerry needs, and I know what Mike needs. And I can target them or group them based upon those competencies. So you kind of take the big and make it smaller. And I think for the teachers, what they're seeing is there's a shift in ownership on the learning as well, to where the students know much more where they're at. And so they're able to focus. For instance, our hybrid courses, the kids who have met the, the competencies and the happy behavior, their class size just went from 28 down to 19 or 15 because that group of 10 is like, I'm set. I, I, I know where I'm at, I know what I'm working on, I know what I'm gonna be working on tomorrow, but that, that 10 or 15 that are left, are like, okay guys, gather around. Let's talk about exactly where we're at and the teacher decides that. Okay, so the, the 10 ones that leave, they're, they're fourth graders, no, no, I'm talking about at the high school in particular. The small, the high yep. school and, For the younger grades, yep. then how many you... <coughs> the elementary classroom, actually, this is a, a great fit for elementary. When you think about, um, when you look into an elementary classroom, instructionally, you see a blended rotational model where a teacher could have the bean table and they're working with four or five kids, and then there's another six or seven kids over here that are working independently in another group that's working as a collaborative um, that's that rotation and it's incredible to watch the flow of that room when the kids understand where some learning is going to take place in this space and it's consistent from room to room. Yes, and yeah, that's I, that's I've where seen it, I've seen it with them yeah. my, my son um, and, goes to school in Detroit. But I've also seen it when they have over thirty kids right. in a in yep. a small space. <coughs> the teacher's a master, but it's yeah, it's mission impossible. kids acting out because yep. the kids act out and um, and she would do much better if she had a class of 20 than if she had a class of 30. Oh, you know what I, mean? I would agree. So that's what I'm asking. Like, yeah. So what is the optimal class size? Well, what smaller you, is better. You, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> smaller you, is 100% better. Do you try to adhere to some rules yeah. on that? Well, um, we have very defined in, in our district. We work very closely with our EA to make sure that we stay within those boundaries. Yeah. It's not a cost savings opportunity for us. Whenever we talk about online, um, originally, the concern was, well, you're going to outsource. And we said, our teachers, our kids, our curriculum. We didn't outsource anything. What we need to do, though, is transform to better meet the needs of our kids. And that's, that's what the commitment we need from you. Then there was, okay, I get it. This isn't about losing my job. This is about transforming my career so that over the next 15 years or 20 years, this is a very different place for kids. I'm in. Nikki, and then we got your seat, Thank you. Um, I guys have like a team of people in the spectrum of different schools that you're um, representing. I echo many of the same concerns that everyone has already shared, but I just want to take an opportunity to get more information. Um, one of the things I, I, I feel like I've heard connected to competency-based education many times is the concern for data collection and data privacy. So one of the things I noticed in your presentation was reporting student ownership. I'd love to have an example of the reimagined audience specific rendering of a transcript, if you will. So whatever you have in here, I'd like to see that 
actually in my hands and just be able to look at it and see what it, what would it look like. Um, just because then I think I could ask more questions about, about how, what the outcome looks like in this type of education model. Uh, a few other questions. Um, you talked about seat time waivers. How, how are those currently being used? Yeah, well, I can um, talk about it from the, the department standpoint. Um, last year, legislation was changed. Seat time waivers were primarily for online and blended learning programs. Um, Section 21F of the state school aid act last year changed that. So now online and blended um, learning for pupil counting purposes is covered under that section. So seat time waivers now um, are for innovative project-based <laughs> learning, for example, or other things like that. So um, with the change in the legislation, all of that moved under a different section of the accounting manual and under the law essentially. Does that also include dual enrollment? That's a different section of the statute. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Do you see competency-based classrooms really at the crime being in every classroom or this being something that will work based on this community I, or the school? I see it as across our entire community, our schools, um, for all, what we did not focus in on one building. Um, it wasn't a pilot for us because there was no experiment. This was a belief um, as a community, as a board of education in what we were doing was not meeting the needs of the kids and we needed to redesign it to better meet every child's needs. And so um, I do see it in every school and across um, the entire organization. So, um, yeah, I know there's some fair criticism. It's just such a large conversation we can't tackle yeah. today. But I just, some of the things that you said <coughs> really do excite me, just the idea that students learn at their own pace. And we, um, we reach them where they're at yeah. and get them to where they would like to be. I guess. And it's interesting, I will tell you, very honestly, the conversations I've had with parents who, um, you know, this wasn't the way I went to school and this isn't how I learned. Um, you know, when you're not eligible to play on Friday night because, you know, a D minus used to be okay and now it's not, those are some tough conversations where a parent will say, wait a minute, what you guys are raising the bar, you know, to a point, and what we're saying is that's no longer good enough for what our kids are facing in the new bus. And so that's why I mentioned we're educating two generations at once. We're trying to transform that. And the biggest piece is you know, with our parents, the resistance um, falls off because they go, I see what you're doing. My kid is learning at a very different level than what they were before. And they also say, it's the growth mindset work. That's a big part of, of what we do. It's a huge part of saying, instead of saying, well, nobody in my family is good at math, we change that conversation to, yet and we're going to work on that we're going to get can and i will in our mindset with learning a lot of first generation families of trying to break that that ceiling of i want to go to college <coughs> and have own my own business so it, it's a big part of that and saying you have to be confident you have to be proficient you can't simply say i was good enough and i can still play football and i can still do what i, I wanted to do we have to change that approach thank you so dr z now we're going to move on uh, it occurs to me that in some ways this is a return to the past of uh, the one room schoolhouse where, uh, yeah, you, you worked on your level rather than on, on strict grade things. But another thought that occurred to me, could you articulate the difference between uh, this and what we used to call tracking, grouping kids according to their ability? Well, go ahead. Tracking <coughs> was a system that was very rigid. So once, once you were placed in a track, you were highly likely to stay in that track for some time, not only within one subject area, but across all subject areas. So what it did is it put students further and further behind as they went through school, further and further behind their colleagues, their peers. <clears throat> this system is completely different. It is very flexible. So I may be a little bit slower in this subject area in meeting these competencies and meeting these standards, but in other subject areas, in other coursework, I could be further ahead. There's more flexibility 
um, in, in the system when you're talking about a truly competency-based, mastery-based system. <clears throat> the, the other thing about it is because of that flexibility, how students are instructed gives you the opportunity, as Dave has said, to really zero in. When, when you see students are behind on a particular standard or set of standards or a particular concept, sometimes working one-on-one -on -one with that student, sometimes bringing those students together as a group is an opportunity you have in this kind of a system. So it's a very, very different system from the old tracking system, which um, I think none of us uh, would ever support. So I think I'm going to propose that we have a different kind of board meeting sometime in the near future where maybe we hold the board meeting in the morning and then in the afternoon we break up into sessions where the board can go to maybe have each of you present at some tables where the board members can go around and get more in-depth conversation and questions and maybe you could bring some students who are a little behind, some students are ready to race ahead, some teachers who didn't like it, <laughs> teachers who do like it, and so that the board can, you know, work from table to table and have a conversation. So I'll work with the board on that, work with your guys' schedule and see if we can do that so the board will have some more time to have this conversation with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Next item on the committee, the whole agenda is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. We have four grant programs listed. Does any board member have any questions on those four grant programs? Cassandra, please, and then Dr. Z. Um, <laughs> are we leaving? Or? There is no maximum. <laughs> well, the could is a competitive competitive grant and it, it never named a number of a number of school districts. So we if, wouldn't uh, if twenty districts were um, judged as part of it to receive the, the grant, then you would be dividing money up that way. If uh, ten also by by competitive it just means that you have to make a certain uh, minimum expectation and then you're okay. then you're in and then which works to our benefit because that will allow us to take some school districts like the ones you've seen today and at the same time take some total novices who would like to work their way through the process and figure out what they want to do, which will help us in our learning as well. Okay. Is that true for the other three that are listed? I'm only, I'm only here to talk about the Migrants, concept. education, and then we have uh, STEM, my STEM, and we have food services. So I think each of those are different. Kyle, in terms of uh, <coughs> the food one, is that amount per district, or is it again they? That's the overall amount that's available for people to apply for. And they can apply for a certain dollar amount. And yeah. And that and that'd be true for the others. So the amount you get depends on how many others have applied, and and um, uh, okay, that that was essentially my question. Tom, please. Uh, Frank, similar to. Similar to my question uh, last month about grants, how many of these are really defined by the legislature and how much has been actually changed or you know, has uh, MDE slash state board has impact on the site, any decisions with regard to grants? Well, so I can give you an example. If you look at the food one specifically, there's in each of the four, there's a section that says what's defined in law and what are MDE proposed bills. So in the food portion, there is four bullets that are defined in the federal regs about what we have to do. And then there's two bullets that say what we included in our grant application that was approved. So what we've tied ourselves to doing as part of our grant application. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. We're going to now call to order the regular meeting at 1235. Quorum of the Board is present. State Board of Education meeting of October 10th is called back to order for discussion on action items. We will move to state and federal legislative update. Artie Ackley, Director of Public and Government Affairs, will provide an update on state and federal issues. Artie, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be really quick, I hope. Uh, the Legislative Committee met, pardon my voice, um, on September 28th, and uh, I'll one major package of bills was discussed at length um, for, and, and subsequently. Uh, so six bill package um, dealing with school and environmental quality. 
I was introduced in the House. House bills 4977 through 82. Last week I uh, sent an analysis of that package to the board for their uh, review and consideration. And um, I'm sure that would hand over to the chair. Uh, so uh, you were also going to check with the chair of the House Education Reform Committee to see whether uh, it was going to be uh, scheduled. Yeah, there's no interest right now of the House Education Reform Committee to take these bills up. So what we discussed was because there's a four million dollar uh, pot of money on uh, school environment, but primarily water, water testing, testing yes. and not water remediation. Right. No, there's no remedial money in it. It's only for testing. Uh, I think there's a there's quite a few pieces in there, but I think testing. Can be no, I mean in the existing money. Oh yeah, see, yes. the money that has. Well, and uh, uh, it also is reimbursement for district staff if they bought water filters. Uh, there, there is reimbursement for uh, mitigation pieces. So what we were t trying to stay focused on was getting this money out before it disappears, and uh, the suggestion was made that we wait because the bills are complex and there are responsibilities, from what I understand that are being defined for MDE, which more properly belong with Laura, or other entities. And also the money that's in it doesn't, wouldn't cover MDE costs. So there's, if it moves forward, uh, we, there would have to be a significant uh, uh, staffing cost analysis so that feedback could be given on how it would work. I mean, that was the discussion that we had. And then um, I, you can't really do that, though, until you see that it's going to be taken off, because you, you may need movement. So our suggestion was that we wait a month or so and see whether it's going to be scheduled. And if it is, then the staff would go ahead and do this rather in-depth analysis, so we can start commenting and reshape the bill. If it isn't, that we wait until this money is a little bit further out, you know, pushing this and then uh, uh, perhaps advocate for the bills to be uh, taken on the committee. Um, I sent that out. We only had two people participating in the conference call, committee conference call. It was Nikki and um, me, and uh, Pam and Lupe weren't there. So uh, uh, we, that was the conclusion we came up with. Marty did send out the information, and then, uh, we moved on and talked about the other two bills that were up of uh, some note to the department, um, which is House Bill 4805, uh, which was correcting an oversight or an omission, I understand, uh, in the School Aid Act. Uh, how are you looking, <laughs> looking down? Sorry, 40, the, according to this, 4805 is the education development plans for homeschool students? Yes, that was yeah. right. There was language added to the uh, supplemental uh, bill, uh, budget bill, that's going through the process right now that would take care of that issue. There was a standalone bill that was in that had a hearing in the House Education Reform Committee um, that was not moved yet. So there may be some um, decision that the issue is being taken care of in the supplemental, so the standing bill would not. Could you explain yeah, those, those issues? Are, yeah. There was. Um, are, are we moving away from the I'm, other bills? Because we'll I, I do. I wanted to. I wanted to discuss that a little bit farther, or do, you, or do we want to? Yeah, why don't I just go through this report and then come back? Okay. Okay, so, um, Marty, and Marty if, if you got this voice cheering for Michigan State, all bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> he claims he did, but I suspect. I'm a little worried about you. I sound like a fraud, but essentially there, were, uh, there was a mistake made. Uh, homeschool students were never before this required to have educational development plans through, through the local school district. So there were two efforts, I understand, to change right. it back to what it was. Then. Home, yes. Homeschool students that use, that are part time students. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That, that use <coughs> uh, school, school, uh, taxpayer money. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, is there more to that? You're, you were just defining what the progress had been, but right. uh, it's from what I understood, it was uh, Lang language. Language was added to the supplemental budget, which um, basically amended the boilerplate language that made the error, depending on what you know where you stand on the issue. Um, so, I think there's a feeling that that is going to solve the problem. Okay, and then uh, House Bill 4735 was a, a really interesting discussion because. Uh, it turns out that we have a number of communities uh, in Michigan that about Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, and even Minnesota, where the nearest dual enrollment is 
facility is a community college in another state. So this was an effort to make sure the kids had access to a community college someplace because after all we are in the United States, uh, even if they're not crossing the imaginary line. And uh, the, uh, to facilitate being able to do that. Right. Yeah. They've been doing it, and we've been approving it, but this just makes it clear that they've been doing it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and those were, and then of course you testified with Roger Curtis uh, with the Talent and Education Development, Talent and Economic Development, Director Roger Curtis on her Athletes Alliance um, initiative. And we didn't, I didn't watch that, but I think it was taste. And Marty, if you can give us the
we should have leadership on and take immediate action and not wait for the reform, House Reform Committee. You know they're not going to vote. I mean, it's like, I think we, I, I'm telling you, there, as I mentioned, you know, um, my husband works in the district where um, there's levy going on. And so, and it is, and he is not alone, and it is not Flint. He's nowhere near Flint. But there's lots of communities across our state that our children are being exposed, and it creates cognitive uh, disorders and problems, and behavior issues. And if there's not, I mean, if we can't support something that safeguards people's uh, cognitive abilities and make sure that they're safe, I don't think we should even exist as a board. I mean, this to me is um, incredibly important, and we shouldn't. We should be taking, making a clear and strong statement that we support these types of issues, um, and we are going to safeguard the well-being and the ac academic abilities of our our kids. Um, so I, I I feel incredibly strong about this, and I say this because there is a big gaping hole, and no one seems to want to deal with this issue or acknowledge that this is a problem because, maybe because of Flint, I'm not, no one seems to want to own it. You know, um, my husband contacted DEQ. They said they cannot come into the school unless they are invited by the superintendent. Even though he's already tested the water and they know that there's lead in it. And so it's like no one wants to, to touch it. So we need leadership. We need, if, if, no, if, if no one else, it should be us. But that's our, it's our most important strategy. So, so I certainly think if the board wishes to pass on something, we can work on it between now and next meeting and have it teed up. And that's what the board and, and that's the, that was the legislative committee's uh, focus. Uh, we just didn't pull together. But the other thing, too, Michelle, I, I am absolutely with you. If you recall, I stood here, Pam and I went off into the corner and crafted that statement. Okay. And my problem is that we have $4 million that's not getting out. And this bill, on top of that, no matter how much money there is until we solve why this money isn't being used, is, and so we understand that and get the money out this isn't going to give us the clues that we need to have more responsibility um, you know, without any money for administration and a pool of money that may not go out either. So I, I, I just, I, you know, I, yeah, I just so, asked. But, but you're not saying we should sure wait. Perhaps, perhaps Kyle should be giving us a report at the next meeting or an interim report to, so that we can find out whether the efforts that we've got right now. I, 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 I just, just want to say two things okay. other than I hope that we get to your from the bill. But the solving the why, I think um, Kyle stated something, and then we had this like turn of events where we now we have this bill of package, this package of bill that helps us to answer the why. And the reason why, um, you know, I think in addition to what uh, Michelle, what you're saying, that's a priority is that we should be protecting our children. And I, I'm in Flint where I see where professionals who I know personally. Um, and, and our public health professionals, such as myself, who are facing uh, charges. Six people, six person has been added, and charges have been up. I think these are things that we have to move urgently on. It's not something that we can just do what we've normally done, and we've seen that. And so I, I apologize that we're not necessarily always going in order around these issues, but I just look forward to hearing from a bill, and I think that again, um, this bill, this, six, this package of six bill provides us this opportunity to expeditiously have these discussions that you're, you're concerned about and help us bring all of those people to the table to uh, do just what we said in, in that recommendation was to bring people to the table. Now this uh, bill package provides um, this, at least this committee to, to help um, shape this conversation and, and quickly move us in the direction that, that I think we need to go. All right, so if the board wishes to work towards uh, uh, comments or a position before next board meeting, we'll be happy to entertain that. No other board comments? I am going to go to public comment because I don't want the public to sit around for an hour and then have to come back and speak. So we are going to go to public comment. We will hold public comment for five minutes, and you'll let people know when they have a minute left. I'm, yes, we're operating with the timer on my phone. I've got it set for five minutes. When um, there's one minute left, I will let you know I need to remind you that it is the board's um, practice to not respond to comments, but they're happy to hear 
what you've got to say. If you filled out a green form and I don't yet have it, if you get that to me, that would be awesome. The first speaker is Emil Lozano, followed by Rich Fink. And then following Rich Fink will be Eric John Japani. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you, uh, Dr. Pugh, for the invitation. Um, my name is Emil Atana from the U.S. Green Building Council. We uh, administer the, the world's largest green building rating system, the LEED certification system, which some of you may be familiar with. We also operate out of our Washington, D.C. office, the Center for Green Schools, that advocates for green schools for all children within one generation. And we define that as by the, the year 2050, we want to see every school uh, a healthy learning environment. We've uh, co-authored and been part of a, a number of research studies around the classroom environment and how that impacts uh, cognitive function, student performance, teacher well-being, retention, and another bunch of other factors. And we recently found that indoor environmental factors such as lighting quality, air quality, water quality, the acoustic environment, all have measurable impacts on student performance. Um, one of those, a uh, number of these bills start to get at some of those issues, but there are significant statistical differences in student performance, cognition, retention, visual acuity based on lighting, uh, the amount of available oxygen, particulate matter in the air, and the quality of the water that's provided in the school. Um, I, I am certainly familiar with the lead issues, being a longtime Michigan resident from Southeast Michigan. Um, what's happening in Flint is heartbreaking, and I also formerly worked at Detroit Public Schools during the beginnings of the Flint water crisis and watched Detroit Public Schools. I worked in the operations department, and um, we proactively tested all the water at our schools, and we noticed quite quickly that there was not an MDEQ protocol to follow for testing, remediation, and all of this. And we worked with MDEQ and the City of Detroit to resolve these issues to everybody's satisfaction. I think part of the reason this pot of money is not being used is that there's not clear guidance for school districts to follow and there's not a procedure. There's also, I believe, a perception in school districts that if they test, this becomes public knowledge that there's an issue. They need some help to message this appropriately to their community so there's students just don't flee off to some other school district under choice or to charter schools or some other things. We need guidance from NDEQ, we need assistance from other state agencies so that school districts know what to do. I think a lot of them are just kind of, they know there's a big issue, it's, it's potentially harming their students, but they don't know what to do and that's why this money isn't being spent. The legislation is not perfect, it could probably use some improvement and some comment and some revisions, um, but it does call on uh, various departments to clarify the process for schools so that they're not putting themselves out there kind of in the wind uh, to be subject to public criticism and a lot of other issues. Uh, I think this is something that we know it's there. Uh, my father was a school teacher. He taught in Detroit, and he is now in his 70s, and I'll tell you, he tests for life. And it has had some impact on him. Uh, so it's personally affecting me. And I think this is something we can't, because what we have is a ticking time bomb, right? There was, we knew Flint was there, people knew, and they sat on it. And we know now, even in, I mean, just about every school district out there has one built before 1978 when we stopped using lead in plumbing fixtures. So it's in every school district. And we need to find a way to act. This bill package is a way to start that conversation and hopefully come up with a proactive way to address this before it comes and sort of bites us from behind like it did with Flynn. So I thank you for your time and I'm available you know, to provide more information, uh, research study. Um, we also have available um, a, a list of other legislation, both proposed and enacted around the country around this issue, including national legislation that was introduced that we can make available um, for you to sort of deliberate and find guidance from. So thank you for the opportunity. So Kyle, will you make sure you get with yeah. them? If Rich Fink would please come to the table, followed by Eric John Chapaniak. Hello, thank you for being here. 
Thank you for having us. <clears throat> I appreciate it being here in Grand Rapids so that we're able to attend and to listen to what's going on. I am a retired teacher. Um, I started as a speech pathologist, worked as kindergarten, first, second grade teacher for 20 years, and ended my career after 38 and a half years. Did daycare for two and a half years with my grandson full time, and then went back to Kellogg'sville for three years, working part time as a speech pathologist again. And I guess I'm here today basically because of my four grandchildren. They are 10, 8, 5, and 9 months. <clears throat> and as I watch how education has evolved, I look at the 38 and a half years that I spent in education, taking a couple of years off to do daycare, watching my grandson go from birth to two and a half years, <coughs> and watching my other grandchildren going through school. I'm very concerned about the direction that we are taking in education. When I got my degree, master's degree in early childhood education, I had a nine hour course that looked at child development. A lot of that was spent studying Piaget. And I remember probably about 20 years into my career being told as curriculum needs were changing, pressure was building, state mandates were changing, being told that Piaget is dead, get over it. And <clears throat> as I have seen education evolve, I see curriculums that I feel are developmentally inappropriate. I feel that we have testing that is absolutely unconscionable. Testing young children, giving them failure when they are four and five years old in preschool. And I think it is absolutely appalling that we continue on this road. Spending that two and a half years with my grandson doing daycare took me back to those nine hours that I spent looking at child development and reinforcing in my mind that everything I had learned and everything that we read and can see in Piaget's study are in fact true. And I don't think anything in the world has changed that has changed child development. I watched my grandson, I watched him go through the stages, the very stages that I used in my report, my thesis that I had to do for the coursework. He went through those stages. I worked with preschool kids as a speech pathologist. I looked at the language development of those children. We see a lot about Detroit Public Schools, Lansing Public Schools, Muskegon Public Schools. I worked in Kellogg'sville, another area where income is low, poverty is high. And when I looked at those kids and I saw the caseload, I worked two days a week, one building, pre-K, K, and one. I had 65 students on my caseload. And all of it was centered around language. One minute. The language that I development that I saw was below average. And I think as a board, you need to take a long, hard look at where we are going with education, what our expectations are. Children should not be required to learn to read in kindergarten. I have a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old that are struggling readers. They hate school. Absolutely hate it. M-Step came around last year and my 10-year-old, at the time nine, called and said, Papa, can I just come and stay with you for a week and not go to school? I hate that test. It makes me feel stupid. I can't do it and I can't read it. And I ask each and every one of you, when you're looking at these testing instruments, are they developmentally inappropriate? 
developmentally appropriate? And are they really giving the teachers anything that they can use in their classroom to really direct instruction? I can tell you as a teacher for 38 and a half years, when I got those test results back, they went in the circular file. I'm sorry, your time is up. Gonna wrap up real quick. Real quick. <laughs> so I just I beg you. Well, that was a wrap. Up. <laughs> think about child development. Think about our children. Do we really want a generation of kids that hate school, that hate learning, and that hate to read? Because all they're done, all that's being done right now, is constant testing and interventions. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I, our final speaker is Eric John Chapania, and if I've said your name incorrectly, please correct me. That is correct. Um, a lot of people don't get it, so thank you for that. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Eric John Chapaniak. I'm a school board member here in Kent County, so I'm really excited that the state board um, came over to these, this neck of the woods uh, to discuss um, their agenda items today. I wanted to mention um, something that member Fecto had stated about um, the 49507 zip code in Grand Rapids has been listed among one of the um, highest for numbers of children exhibiting elevated blood lead levels and our county government has put in a lot of effort to figure out why that is and a lot of it stems from um, the plumbing but a lot of it also stems from the pre-19 78 housing um, that was built in Grand Rapids, which is a majority of the city. Um, so I really appreciate you looking into um, uh, some mediation for that. Um, my district is currently seeking an MSTEP waiver, um, and I wanted to speak on that a bit. Friends of Kent County Schools, the lobbying group of us school board members, um, we talked about how our results came back from the end step this year in September. Um, that's when school districts received it, at least in my case, and a lot of the other ones in Kent County. Um, and that's not enough time to get that to parents. If we believe that education has to be a community and parental effort as well, then we can't test kids in the spring and get them the results back once they've already started the next school year, once they've wasted the summer, once the only people that they come into contact with are their parents who could be filling in that gap if they had these results. Um, I also wanted to mention I attend Grand Valley State University right now. I am planning on going into the teaching profession. Just recently swapped my major, so uh, I'm going to teach social studies, political science, government, all that good stuff. Um, so it's really good to see how boards operate and be on a board myself. Um, so I've just taken everything in. Um, but my district, Kenway Hills, is putting on the Personalized Learning Conference with the ISD this May. And so right now, one of the good things at GV, we're working on finding funds to sponsor young um, or just graduated students um, to attend this Personalized Learning Convention um, so that they can take that wherever they might end up, wherever they might end up teaching. So that's a good thing um, that's happening at GV right now. Um, we're also working to expand our Finish Strong grant, which provides $1,000 for fourth year students that have taken 15 credits um, each year. So we're, uh, my mission, I chaired the Student Senate's Educational Affairs Committee. We're trying to expand that effort to a fifth year to incentivize those uh, majors that take five years, like education, um, and say, here's an extra thousand dollars if you've still done all the steps required, if you've still taken the um, suggested course load of 15 credits per semester, um, just hopefully to incentivize teaching a bit more because we know the numbers are going down, but also um, to show them that we're committed to seeing them through for the whole five year education that they have. Um, the last thing and the major point I want to bring up is university funding. Um, so I know this board doesn't directly control that, but I, we all know legislators and we talk a lot about legislation and talking with them. Um, Grand Valley receives, out of the 15 state universities, uh, we receive 14th 
Um, in the value of that, we received $3,040 per student per year. The state average is $5,345 um, per student per year. So if Grand Valley were to receive that additional funding of uh, about $2,000 more per year, we generate another $50 million that we could put toward these projects and these good things that Grand Valley is doing. Um, GV tuition is still below average, so it is a great deal. Um, and our overall expenditures are low, so we are an efficient um, governing university. But it doesn't make sense that um, we receive $3,040 per year when schools like Wayne State receive $8,736 per year in the 16-17 calendar year. So there has to be some equation out there that you know, we don't understand, or I don't know about. So just, um, I'd encourage you all to ask your legislative friends, ask anyone you know, why is there such a huge discrepancy? Why are state universities um, paid per pupil such varying um, amounts of money? All right, thank you for being here, Chad. So with that, uh, would I at all have any support to try to come back in 45 minutes? <laughs> Yes, all right, so it is uh, 105, so 150, thank you. I haven't started yet, I was waiting for you. Good afternoon, the time is now 1.55 and the quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education meeting of October 10, 2017. It's called back to order. We move to the committee of the whole meeting. The next item on the committee of the whole is presentation on transparency dashboard update. This item cover, covers several updates related to the work of every student succeed tech, transparency dashboard, including a general status update, parent feedback, and screenshots of the latest designs. Next steps will be to continue to provide monthly updates on the transparency dashboard uh, as we move towards implementation, but even then it will be phased in, so there will be continual work on this. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, and Chris Janser, Assistant Director of Office of Educational Assessment and Accountability. Thank you. Thank you. We are trying to uh, get some PDFs loaded so that we can show you some of the uh, some of the dashboard screens that we've uh, completed since last time we were in front of you. Um, while that's going on though, I can start with just a general update. Um, there we go. All right, uh, so project schedule, I think this is probably going to look familiar to you all now. Um, this is the third time we've done this. Um, we are on track. Uh, we had a major milestone this last week uh, where uh, we had completed the designs for phase one and got them over to the developer so that the, the building of this will has actually started. Um, we have, um, yeah, so we're, we, we're on track. Let me move on here. Um, since last time, we had a uh, second advisory group that met towards the end of September. Uh, eight of the 12 members attended. Uh, we had one and a half hours of really great feedback. Um, the first advisory group that met in August, it, we really focused on logistics. Um, so this was really one where the almost the entire time was spent on um, doing some testing and getting some feedback on the designs. Um, we have a advisory group next week um, where we'll be doing more testing. Um, and I should note going forward, um, the advisory groups with the testing that we'll be doing with them will be informing later phases of the dashboard. And that's just the way the development works. We sort of had to lock down for phase one. And so going forward, these will be like enhancements or phase two kind of things. An advisory group is not Focus. There's Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I'll get to that here on the next slide. The, so to um, sort of go back, the, the advisory group meets once a month. Um, these, it's, it consists of parents that are more involved. So these are typically 
either um, local PTA uh, presidents or officers, uh, or, or just really, um, you know, in their child's school um, um, quite a bit. The focus groups, we had three uh, that happened the last week of September, uh, two in Muskegon County, one in Saginaw County, and then we've got three more happening this week, um, Bridgeport on Thursday, and then the uh, to be determined in Wayne County that has actually been finalized uh, after this presentation was done. We've got one going on tonight and then another on Thursday in Wayne County as well. The focus groups are, um, these are parents that aren't as involved. Um, this is to, so sort of the, when we think of parents, the larger group out there um, that we're trying to reach with this parent dashboard. And I have quite a bit of feedback uh, from the first three. So the first three, we had 34 participants, roughly about a dozen in each. Um, these parents, uh, demographically, these were mainly parents coming from rural or suburban areas or school districts, um, not super ethnically diverse. They were economically diverse. Um, the, the kids' ages that they represented were also fairly diverse. Um, we had a good spread across the different grade spans. And um, most of them, I think it was about 75%, had not used my school data. That's the existing portal. Um, so it was really interesting that we had that large of a number. Um, that was somewhat surprising to me, actually. Um, so going through the feedback, um, they were asked where they got their uh, information source or information from for their uh, children's education. Um, most were looking at their local school or district website. Uh, those involved in their parent teacher organizations were using like social media pages for that, um, general internet searches, um, and then you see my school data and some of the other uh, state level stuff. Um, we also had hard copy handouts and then direct like phone contact or when they are at the school picking kids up, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Expectations uh, from parents that were participating in these focus groups, uh, they were asked how or um, what they would anticipate finding on a parent dashboard. And I think I have a graph later on that shows some of the, the ranking of this too, but um, somewhat, not surprisingly, uh, some of the usual things that we talk about quite a bit, uh, so school performance data, graduation rates, um, and then some of the things that we don't uh, currently do a lot of reporting on, so like program offerings, school of choice options, and then school curriculum programs, advanced courses, and extracurricular activities, which uh, the dashboard should be covering in phase two, that's some of the points of pride stuff that we had talked about, um, I think back in August. So they were also asked um, why they would most likely visit the dashboard. Um, more than half said to learn about how their kid's school performs. Um, and then we sort of get into the comparison bit here. So we had about 40, 40% 40, um, 40 of those on the focus group that would compare the performance of their kids' school uh, to a similar school, and then just a little under 30 that would find information about uh, how students are served at a particular school, and uh, not too surprisingly, um, because these are current parents in Michigan schools, we had under 10 saying they would search for a new school. All right, so here's what I was talking about as far as what's most important to parents. Uh, this represents uh, any metric that got over a 50% response. Um, so all of these up here uh, had at least half of the parent focus group saying they thought these were the most important things. Um, somewhat surprisingly, ratio of students to instructional staff uh, came in first. Uh, and then um, we've talked about this as well, but student performance on state assessments came in second. 
um, extracurricular activity or opportunities again pretty high and again this is something that we have not reported at a state level um, this is something that we would have to start collecting basically um, and then some of more the more usual things too that we have done before although access to, to technology is also something that would be new to us um, but Again, all of these were picked from the uh, policy document that was approved back in June. So these are all anticipated to be on the dashboard at some point. Uh, we also talked about uh, searching for a school. And we, um, I think we talked about this back in September uh, for our board presentation. but. Um, allowing for different types of search options, so both a uh, text box where the parent could type in something. Uh, we actually have a auto-suggest feature now, so you start typing and it sort of gives you suggestions on what you might be looking for. Um, and then parents also wanted consistency across the pages with how the searches operate, so not sort of a no-brainer. Um, all right, so here's, this is a bit complicated, and hopefully we got it, yeah. Okay. So I have a PDF that we'll hopefully be able to show, um, but there's also this paper handout here that we can refer to. I think this is the mobile one. Oh, you couldn't? Okay, well, let's look at the uh, paper handout then. Uh, so the first page on the handout. This shows, uh, not, I'll explain that uh, these are pretty much the final designs. We still have to do a little content work. Um, so some of the, the uh, verbiage along the left and all that, that still has to be worked out. Um, but visually, this is pretty darn close to what we'll be seeing um, later on this year when we do a public release. The first page on the paper handout shows the search screen um, and looking at that you can see the search for a school box um, and you can type in again we have suggestions where it's the zip code school district city or county name um, and then parents can also search by map and it'll zoom in um, if you flip to the next page you'll see and I'm holding it up here too. Mm -hmm. You'll see the auto suggest feature that I just talked about as well. Um, again, typing in the first couple letters of something, uh, and you'll have you'll see a breakout of schools that match those uh, districts that match, and then it matches. Um, this got a really positive response from the parent tests. Uh, it seemed like they were really enthused about that. And then if we flip to Oh no, I think that's it for the search. So if we go back to the presentation. <laughs> oh, oh. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so then moving along, uh, the school overview, and this is what you could think about as sort of a traditional das dashboard page where we would show sort of high-level information on um, sort of a school's performance. Um, so parent feedback that we got, they liked that uh, school information at the top of the overview page. Um, and actually, you know what, I'll refer to the handout as we talk about this. It might be... Um, easier to connect as we're doing this. So if we look at page three of that handout, um, it'll have Howell High School overview towards the top. Um, what the parents liked was this first section, you'll see a little map there, and then just basic information on the school, the school's the principal's name, school's address, website, that sort of stuff. Um, they liked that. Um, they also would have, they would like to see, um, and that kind of gets into my bullets there, a uh, picture of the school, whether that's a building or something to be a little bit more personable with it. Um, demographic info as well. Um, they talked about um, including a school-generated narrative of something to put a little bit of a local flavor into it too. Um, on the flip side of that, they 
they also had concerns that if we did go to something like that, sort of the maintenance of that information. So um, knowing if it was up to date or how out of date it was, um, clarifying who actually put it there if we were to do local information, so that sort of stuff. Um, moving on, I'll sort of talk about, then you'll see eight sort of graph tiles. Um, and again, these are on the school overview page, page three. Um, they liked the ability, if you look sort of at the top of those, that row of first three, there's what looks like a pull down where you can then filter by student group. Um, originally, we didn't have that um, based on feedback they were. Um, and, they, and, and again, it was a little bit mixed. Um, parents sort of, they discussed about uh, the overview being an overview of the whole school, but then we also had parents that would have that wanted to basically filter um, if they were interested in a certain student group on that first page like to uh, like students with disabilities. Um, the you have all these graphs for all the different mm -hmm. groups. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, if a parent selected the pull down and chose a student group, the graphs on this screen update to show that particular student group. Really? So this is when that end size comes in. So with the so for reporting purposes, this would be 10. Yes. So this would be 10 on this transparency dashboard. Correct, yep. Okay. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 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 and then uh, the last bullet there, uh, some parents thought that the overview had too many graphs. Um, so we have eight. Um, and the way that this would work is if a school didn't have this information, we wouldn't show it. Um, so there would be up to eight graphs on this overview page. Um, one of the things, so I mentioned that some of the content we're still ironing out, but some graphs were not of interest or had confusing labels. Um, the labels is something that we still have to work out. Um, I know we have, we use EduSpeak quite a bit, and so when we say proficiency, a lot of us know what that means, but that doesn't always translate uh, with parents. So. We're actually going to be doing a survey, I think later this month, that kind of gets at um, the labels and what makes sense for that. I, have you thought about, this This might be a place where you could put a video that says click mm -hmm. here if you want to, so that they actually literally say, okay, see that first one up here? I mean in the video, kind of like, or, or maybe they're showing, you know, they're on the computer as well, and they're, they have this page up and they can click and say this is what this Yes. I, I know that as a CPA, when I give a document, if it has more than 10 numbers on it, sometimes people just freeze up or glaze, you know, drive Absolutely. over. Just different people are made differently. So I could imagine, and maybe you're, that people could really get freaked out over seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Um, the videos did come up, and I think I talked about that in a little bit. I don't know if it came well, up. If it doesn't work, for it doesn't this, work. I'm, but, not, I'm not trying to. Yeah. Try. I think we, like to yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we actually are going to try, uh, and I'll get into it in a little bit, but there's like a getting started page where we would do, yes. at least we would get started with a video there, but I could see us doing something um, like support kind of, or how do, what does this mean, or how do I do this, right. and it's like a, a minute or two long video right. basically. Yeah. Yep. Michelle? Um, to that instruction, just to raise your ratio, yes. where is that? That will be, um, I don't have it in the uh, printed out handout, but you would find that um, if we're looking at this, the left hand navigation, it's a very simple navigation. Um, that would go, I believe, under staff. So why wouldn't it be on the main? On the main? main. Um, well, it's not on the main currently because these are, you'll recognize these as the primary indicators from the board policy document. That's that wasn't a primary indicator. Now, maybe based on parent feedback, we'd want to make it more prominent. But right. it was, yeah, so but, uh, yeah, when I they asked the parents about the, they gave them all of those things in the document, whether they were primary or secondary, that's one that we had thought of as like a, a more secondary that parents said, no, we, we care about more. So I think we need to think about, does that mean it gets put on the front page? Is the information clear enough? Now we can we can calculate. We've done. Um, Chris and the team have gone back through and refined the business rules to get it close to instruction. It's ratio of instructional staff to FTE, but that's not the same as class size. It's not equivalent. And would parents understand that? Yeah. 
folks. You have instructional staff in the building doing all kinds of things that, that's not directly equivalent to class size. So if it's 25 to 1, that doesn't mean you have class sizes of 25. So I think we'd want to be careful about, but we've talked about the only good way to get accurate class size is to actually have the school or district tell you. Because there's not a great way in the data to, to know exact class size. So is it that parents want to know ratio or they want to know class size? How many kids yeah. is Johnny going to be in a class with? Although you could put instructional to student and then let the school populate and make it clear that we the could. school is populating the, right. the teacher right. to student ratio. Well, they'd be populating the class size. We could class calculate size, the ratio. Yeah, that's Here's, class then you get into a timing thing. We currently have ratio of instructional staff to FTE. We don't currently have class size. So well, I mean that you would give them the opportunity to popular but they don't have to and right, if, if you did that then I think you get around heavily if you just you say we will give you the opportunity to populate yep. all of these things a yeah. lot of these things right this gets into the mechanics of what it, how you populate your own data on the on a state website so that's actually Chris mentioned that points of pride collection okay. that'll be the primary way that schools can give us information that we can feed up into the dashboard they can't <coughs> they can't just go in and type things in or it, it's a little bit more a little more complicated. So points of pride is slated for phase two. So my question becomes, do we keep ratio of instructional FTE in the back pages to start, and then when we have class size and can marry ratio and class size, then we escalate it. Like I wouldn't want to put information on the front page if parents might misinterpret it and we didn't have that other piece of information. That would that would worry me. Because we wouldn't want someone to look at the instructional ratio and or it could be smaller. It could say ten to one because you have a lot of staff and then they walk into a classroom and they say, I see twenty kids, you're lying. Right. You know? There's a very face validity thing about classes. You can see how big a class is when you go into a school. It's not. So we want to be careful about giving good information, but having it be kind of well-rounded. So you're saying you can pull people to get at that? We def the ratio of instructional FTE to, sorry, instructional FTE to student FTE, or whatever it is, that is planned for phase one. We have to figure out where we put it. The class size would have to come in through something like points of pride, and that's planned for phase two. But there's no way that you we do know that part. We know how many instructional FTEs are in the school of students. Yeah, because I know I'm, that's what, like, I'm a classroom teacher for a student. Yeah, I mean, you, you can get close to that, but then schools organize their instructional staff in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful not to assume we know what a classroom teacher is. Yeah. Or if a, some schools may be doing co-teaching. So yeah. Yeah. you can't see that in the data. You, can't, you would see that there's a... Uh, an ELA FTE and a math FTE and then you see how many kids but if they're co-teaching that would it you know there's a lot of my point is what we can see is how many FTEs there are in instructional assignments and how many kids and we can give that ratio and we will that's not as complete of a picture of how many kids am I in class with or how many if I get pulled out for small group instruction or if I get pushed into a special or those types of more nuanced things about a kid's experience that we can't deduce from the data. If I was a parent I'd just be the teacher to student well, we can do that generally, but teach or not like coaches or other kinds of supplemental. We took those types of things out, but we also included, like an example of what um, Chris and the team made sure to put back in is anybody with a special ed instructional FTE code. Mm -hmm. okay. Because you wouldn't want to remove those FTEs from right. the count because that is clearly how the instruction is delivered. Does that include <clears throat> Yes, I believe. We'll have to double I check. So, yeah. I think that was one of the specific ads you said yeah. came back in. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I'll add to sort of generalize the question, um, sort of getting at the table that I had where it was, you know, what was sort of most popular. Um, we did talk about um, instituting something where we look at uh, the web page statistics and sort of what's getting the most traffic and then mm -hmm. driving that overview based off of that eventually. Mm -hmm. So sort of starting with the key indicators, but then uh, maybe it's maybe that gets changed because a lot of people are going to some sort of <laughs> class sizing or, or ratio and, and so if we're getting, you know, a hundred thousand hits on that and you know, might not know what your stat on your Right. Yeah. yeah. So we did we did a little bit of a debrief last week on just sort of brainstorming yeah. like, oh you know you know, how could we handle this if if, um, if we did move away from displaying the primary metrics on the overview and, and doing something like that, so. What if you had a feedback on the page, you just said what information do you want to know or what you need to know? Yeah. Okay. 
And we're also giving this out. I mean, obviously, it's an open meeting, so uh, educator, you know, uh, administrators could be seeing what we're doing as well, because I think they would also have pushback, like, this is going to be wrong. This is not going to be clear, or it's going to give the wrong indicators if you do this to my school. Or my, you know, and so it'd be good to hear that pushback as well. Yeah, and I've heard some of it where people, you know, they come from the district that has less money, they don't have larger class sizes. You know, and so they're like, well, the stomachs look bad, and we really got our control. Will it make kids go to another school? I think make it worse. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a good point about audience. We talked about that a couple times at the board table. So. Um, so time to make two points here. One is that we are really trying to stay true to designing the parent voice first. So administrator and parent voice often run in conflict to each other. So we are trying to say we're going to build something that parents say works for them, and then we're going to figure out who it doesn't work for and why and what else we can do. But if we want parent voice to be heard, we have to privilege it above the other voices. So we're starting there. Um, and then two, that we really see this as iterative. You know, we are going to launch something in December. The team is on track. They're awesome. It's going to have to keep keep getting better. If we're going to add more data, if we do things like metric tracking, we're going to find out that nobody cares about post-secondary enrollment or whatever, and maybe that moves to a back page. Mm -hmm. I think, again, if we're staying true to this is driven by our end users and our end users are parents, we have to be willing to, you know, it, for, for myself, like, I think advanced coursework is incredibly important, but if not one parent cares about it, then I need to be okay with saying right. it can go sit somewhere else on the, on the dashboard. Um, you know, so I think it's a good point. So we actually haven't been asking administrators as much at this point while we're designing. Actually, we haven't. We've been asking parents okay. and staying true to that feedback. But it is a, I would say it's a red flag that what's good for parents might not be good for some other audiences. That's where, and I guess it, it's unfortunate it's probably phase two or three, that you get the opportunity to asterisk something and, and just tell the district, you can asterisk as many, as many as you want if you think something isn't given a clear picture. Right. But I don't know how you do that with all the information that's already there. Sure. So, but I do think that giving them the opportunity to say, by the way, this is why this looks a little weird, or giving them a video, or giving them, mm -hmm. you know, an area to fill it, populate us a couple sentences. Right. You know, another thing that will happen as we continue to move into more transparency reporting and people using the data, and this is an absolutely true thing about data, when people start looking at it and start asking questions, it gets cleaner. Mm -hmm. So it's yep. very possible schools have been submitting data that's not accurate. Right. And we don't know that it's not accurate. We don't look at schools' data and say, that's wrong. You know, if you tell us this is what your school has, they have 500 kids in special ed, then we say, okay, you have 500 kids, or whatever, that's a bad example. That gets all the <laughs> But we, we, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of need for people, for, and so when you use data, it gets cleaner because people start saying, we don't, this is wrong. Right. We don't have 700 right. suspensions. We had seven. Like, right. what happened here? Um, and we do some data quality checks and things. But in, at the end of the day, districts have to give us the right information so we can share it. So it will, I think you're right, uh, I think probably a couple features to work to build in that we want to is a explain my data and then also a ask a question about, you know, or, or um, it's not appeal, but it's to say, like, this looks wrong. and giving good guidance to administrators for if data looks wrong when you see it back, here's where you go check or here's where you, and, and that's not all Chris's team, that's actually a lot of Steffi and a lot of some other pieces. So we'll see that a lot as we start using new types of data. Um, do you have, uh, I know that you shared a PowerPoint, but do you have something that we can, sh would you like us to share publicly and be getting feedback at this point in time? Or that is like jumping ahead of ourselves. Yeah, so just, I, you guys all saw this. We did give you a written report of the parent focus group. And you, you know, this is obviously a public meeting, so these are public documents because we're sharing. I think getting feedback and sharing them is fine. I would caution that, again, we're trying to have, so talk to parents, try to bring parent feedback in, um, and others, uh, other voices taking control of the narrative around this dashboard. So it's a, we want to show you where we're working, but we also don't, Want, we want to be able to give it, get it across the finish line the way we promised it. Sure. So, uh, you know, I, that's our best advice. And again, we're sharing it here, so it's, it's public now. But yes, we would, we would like to hear from parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah. All right. So before, before I advance the slide, let's take another look at the handout here. Um, <coughs> go to page four. This is just another. So this was also something that we added after. Um, some advisory group, and I think the first focus group uh, as we were getting information back. So um, 
again, you guys won't be able to see it from here, but just flipping the page over, it's another view of the school overview. Um, and you'll notice the trend line graphs have changed to bar charts. Um, that's something that, um, again, it was, it was mixed. Uh, some people liked the trend lines, and some people were like, oh, what, what would that look like as a bar chart? And so um, we have a little toggle sort of in the upper right, right. of that, so you can toggle between those two. Uh, all right, so moving along, uh, and we sort of went through this already. Um, so then um, getting more into the detailed graphs, um, if we go from the overview and you can click on any of these tiles, or you can navigate to more detail along the left-hand side using the navigation there. Um, but if we... Uh, so I'll kind of be talking about the next page, page five, which is a bigger, it's really just a line, a trend line graph, yep. Uh, we would click through to that. Um, they, uh, so, sorry, sorry, I'm kind of looking at the slide here and trying to match it up to the page. Uh, so the parents, uh, going from the overview to the detail, um, some parents wanted clarity on how to locate the more detailed information. So some didn't know that just by clicking on the graph, you could actually sort of drill into a more detailed view of that um, or use the navigation. So um, that's something that uh, our designer is working through right now. Um, parents also wanted to know um, what would be coming in future phases. So some of like the extracurricular stuff we won't have with this first go around. Um, but what would that look like? Would we actually have a space for it and show like a coming soon or you know coming in later in 2018? Um, that sort of stuff. Um, and then the graphs are understandable point up there. That kind of gets to the um, flipping between the trend lines and the bar charts. Um, sort of to an earlier point, uh, people understand things a bit differently. So we're trying to give options but also keep things simple and not overwhelming. Okay, so if we then look at that blow up, I'll kind of describe it a little bit here. Um, so again, you would get to this by clicking on one of those eight tiles off of the overview, or if you look on the left here, you'll see uh, it shows a left-hand navigation uh, expanded, um, and there are choices there under the sort of the student menu, uh, some sub-choices there. Um, so this person clicked on the uh, student performance, so this would be like student proficiency, on state tests. And uh, this graph as well, you'll notice there's a little toggle in the upper right, so you can toggle between the trend line and the uh, bar charts. And you'll also notice this has two pull downs, one to filter by the student group, so these are the subgroups that we talked about. Um, and then because this is test data, uh, it defaults to sort of all subjects rolled together, but you can break that out by the different subjects as well. So if you're interested in um, looking at math uh, for the school overall, you would choose that on the right pull down. And then if you wanted to filter that further into a certain student group, you can do that as well. I think if we flip it over, um, yeah, it shows the pull downs um, clicked basically, so you can see the choices in there. Um, and then if we flip it again, um, this is looking at sort of a bar chart view. This is looking at um, post-secondary enrollment. So we're no longer looking at student performance. It's um, just an example of what a bar chart would look like in a bigger, that more detailed view. So I'm just wondering if we, we use the words college and career ready there, um, which I don't think is Yeah. Sure. And this this might be something where we test out like our labeling as well to see you know does that make sense or, or not. So yep, great point. Just drop it. Okay. All right, so moving on to the site organization or navigation, I talked a little bit about this. Um, 
already with the, uh, with the left hand nav. If we flip to the next page, so from that bar chart uh, to this, it's uh, getting started and it's, uh, again, it's going to look really small on the handout and I apologize for that, but there are pages that sort of get at the support of the uh, dashboard. So getting started, um, Tom, this is where we were sort of talking about the videos earlier where we might have like an initial, um, if you're new to this, here's a two or three minute long video, things to check out, here's what such and such means. Right. Um, we think we would probably start here with that. Um, I don't know, we, we need to do some more parent testing on the content of this. Um, but this is sort of the, the frequently asked questions, the tutorials, um, explanations, that See, sort of you know, stuff. You know what I think is going to happen that's exciting about all this? Is that I think there'll be nonprofits and others that will also do their own videos and say, look at this, or here's how we, you know, view, you can go here and this is what you do and, you know, show, I, you know, I just think that uh, for people who are activists in certain areas, they'll be able to say, this is how you really use this data. People who are interested, there's going to be people uninterested and yep. won't use this at all. Yep. But I think it's it's exciting that there's going to be, who knows what's going to happen with this. As long as the data is clear and as accurate as we can, and you know, I, I just, I'm excited. Yeah. I, the thing that I really like about the Getting Started page, um, and you'll, you'll be able to pick it out at least just because it's the only graphical part, is um, we are planning on doing sort of an explanation of what the charts are. So just a basic, like, here's how you use this chart, here's what the axes are and all that kind of stuff. Because um, it's kind of like, well, how many people do we lose right now on my school data where we do have explanations, but it's not a, a very graphical explanation. And, you know, so it's how many people are we losing because they don't want to read a few paragraphs of something explaining a chart. So um, I thought that was cool when I saw that. It, so, um, the, uh, so clarifying the difference between the global My School data and dashboard navigation. Um, so if we look at the Getting Started page, you'll see at the very top there's like a dark band. Uh, it says My School data, and there are a couple of menu things underneath that. Um, that is the global site navigation. So this is sort of the the wrapper around uh, the dashboard. Um, there was a little bit of confusion. Um, amongst the parents um, with that and then the dashboard navigation um, you'll see school transparency dashboard and then there are um, two, five things sort of along the top there that's navigation for the dashboard itself um, so we're trying we're working with Seppi on that um, Seppi is redoing my school data and so we have to figure out how the global sort of wrapper works with the dashboard and it is exciting, um, you know, like, like Chris just said, Sethi is redoing my school data um, kind of fundamentally, and this is really the flagship project, the one that's going first. So everything we're learning from here will be used there, and we're excited about that. I think it's um, my school data and the data that sits behind it, there is a ton of information on there, but the technology has advanced, our understanding of what users want has advanced, and now there's funding and a couple key opportunities and like you said Tom I think we can lead with this project and really help with the site redesign so we're, we're positive about it and like the left nav versus top nav this was a funny just a <laughs> just a huge debate happened over left versus top and which is better and whose research was better and it turns out parents like left nav so that was really really positive we spent a lot of time on that I'm like I don't care please just tell me when it's over <laughs> okay all right. So what else is key for us to um, And so you sort of just talked about the, the, the clarifying the staff and student options on the menu. This is the left navigation. Um, so again, people think through things differently. Um, some parents totally got the left hand navigation. Um, some wanted more of a table of contents sort of thing along the left hand side. And it's like, well, you know, so it's sort of trying to balance simplicity, understanding and and sort of a comprehensive thing. Um, most parents, though, what we tested was, is the navigation working? Where would you click if you wanted more detailed information? And most did um, uh, gravitate to that left navigation. It's like, oh, well, I would click on student just to see what happens there. So um, the left hand nav, it, it did sort of win that little debate that we had. Um, 
Okay, so we went through the getting started. Um, if we flip in the handout to the next page, it's a contact us page. Um, this is one that we need um, a bit more work on, um, a bit more parent feedback. The nice thing is that the structure of this, uh, the developer can do the structure and then we can develop more of the content um, as we move forward into the, these months as they are slowly getting colder. Um, but this would be where a parent could contact the state in some manner, um, and we're also thinking of having questions along here too. Um, this isn't super finalized yet, so we also have sort of questions on what should be on here. Um, and we continue to encourage you guys, if you have a sense of what questions parents would ask that you repopulate in FAQ, send them to us. Or if you yeah. do show this to someone and they say, well, I want to know how I look up my kid's school or whatever, something, we can, if we know actual questions that parents will ask, we can write answers to them versus imagining what they might ask. Right. Um, and then on the, the back page of this, uh, this is the top 10 and 10. Um, so this we are. So this is an existing report or screen on my school data. Um, this is uh, it was reskinned in the dashboard design, and this will be a link uh, on that top nav. You can actually see it kind of highlighted there. There's a state overview. Um, it it will go to this, which then basically links to a bunch of um, metrics that tie into our top ten and ten initiative. Okay, so moving along to school comparisons, this was really interesting, um, this conversation with parents. Um, going into this, and so this, this whole process has been really enlightening. You know, you go in with some sort of expectation in your head, it's like, oh, I think this is how it's gonna go, but then um, the school comparison conversation is a great example of where um, we actually learned uh, quite a bit from parents. So. Um, going into it, at least I was expecting, oh, they're going to be interested in, you know, the closest whatever number of schools and schools that look similar to their own kids' school, like, demographically. Um, the first few comments, though, actually were um, offering, uh, school offerings. So they were interested in preparing schools that had similar um, course offerings, uh, similar offerings with uh, services for, like, special education students or uh, English learners, um, test uh, uh, performance on the state assessments and graduation rates came next after that, um, but it was surprising that um, sort of the, the offerings was sort of forefront in that discussion. Um, along the left there, you'll see the, uh, the, like the proximity and some of the usual things that we typically think about when comparing schools, those did come up. Um, and I think like long term, we're hoping to move to like a fully customizable comparison tool for this. So um, we might have like a default comparison set up, but then a, a, a parent could click on something and then like select whatever variables they want to compare. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that for this first go around, but that is sort of the long term goal. Um, one of the other really interesting things that uh, the connecting feeder slash receiving schools, um, so Again, typically, at least I think of comparing like a high school to a high school, an elementary school to an elementary school. One parent had uh, a kid in each of the traditional grade spans, and he was interested in sort of comparing the district's elementary, middle school, and high school, and what happens with those transition periods. Um, so that was kind of completely different um, to hear from me. Um, so yeah, so we talked about the customizable stuff, and then head-to-head -head comparisons would be sort of the traditional, um, and this did come up, there is a want for this, where you are looking at a school and you want to pick another single school to compare with. Um, and so that will be built in as well, probably not for this first go-around, but coming soon after. Um, I think I'm almost done here. So. Uh, other feedback, again, these are some sort of no-brainer things. Keep the language and terms simple, um, including the glossary. Again, we're going to do a survey on some of our terms and labeling. Um, they wanted communication, uh, when this goes public, they wanted it to be communicated through multiple ways. Um, I think the big takeaway here was more communications from the schools. Um, as well as from the state. So we'll have to think through how to 
work that out. Um, and of course, be clear with the purpose and value of this dashboard, um, and then tying it to the top 10 and 10 vision. Um, is that? Yep, that is it. Thank you very much. I, I, yeah, I, um, I, I really love all the work you've done to be able to have this interaction and delve deeper. It's just, I, I do think it's really wonderful, and I, I thank you for all your work on that. And, sure. um, the, the, I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe it was in a recent article that I missed, but how are we with the state, with the feds on this? That was going to be part of my update, but they're okay. still telling us two to three weeks. They're, you know, it's they have peer review going on, so yeah. I think for a couple of weeks. Okay. So I, I keep reading these articles, and we're sort of like this. Yeah. 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 Very different yeah. from the rest <laughs> of the country, <laughs> but I think it's good. That's I think good. It's good. I, I think it's designed I'm, it for I'm, Michigan. I, uh, I'm excited about it. So. Right. Yeah. 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 I was. Then Mine was more um, in relationship to or in relation to the demographics of the folks that you yes. are um, getting yes. information from. Right. And I know you, I got an email that you're going to Saginaw right away. I knew that those demographics were going to lead to something like this. I know you haven't gone to Bridgeport, but this is not going to bump this up that much. And like you said, you know, you're surprised by the input from the parents and it's going to change from different groups. So this concerns me. Yeah. Just knowing of the schools that you went to in Saginaw. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's concerning. So, and I, and I and I wanted to get back with you on that. And I did get some response back from some parents that were concerned about it as well. Okay. Yeah, um, I would think that uh, once we roll this out, that we do let parents sign up for a webinar monthly to kind of instruct them as to how to do this and maybe archive that so people can click on it and, and see the archived uh, webinar. Um, I obviously think that we need more parents in the focus groups. I don't even know if you could do an online focus group. I know I've participated in, you know, there's a lot of online things that somehow you sign up and then they go through it and you, you know, you, it's not, uh, it, you, know, you can raise your hand or else just, uh, if it's too many, you can just give the input, give the input right right along, you know, in there. So I don't we did know some if that's virtual possible. focus groups with parents for ESSA, ESSA development. Yeah. Um, and then we have, like Chris said, we have a survey plan that will go out more broadly. But all, all of these are good ideas. And like I said, um, we we, we want to keep talking. So yes, we will release something, but then there will be things added all the time and keep changing. So you know, development, you have to say, develop this much, and we are sure. Um, you know, like I always joke about, our development team is like crying in the back room while we keep saying, well, we'll let you know, and also get it done in two weeks. And they're like, you have to tell us. Um, but they're moving forward anyway. They're good. They, they know what to do. So we appreciate the, no, and, uh, we appreciate the ideas on how to yeah. get to parents because that is, it is hard. You know, we know that this, we could use more different, we can always use more types of parents reflecting on it and more ways to get to them. And the, somebody from the uh, Michigan PTA yesterday said, <laughs> Um, well, we have a grant to do parent engagement around ESSA, and I thought, good, because they're about ready to run out of college money, I think. So right. that'll be really helpful. Thank you so much. You guys, I am just mm -hmm. very happy with what's going on. Yeah, the, um, the advisory group, actually, the one that meets once a month, um, most of those participants are virtual. Like, they connect through, like, uh, a webinar kind of tool. Um, so that works for them. Uh, the focus groups are the sort of the in-person kind of thing. Yeah, so. and they may be less computer savvy which is why we need to do this as well. Yeah. yeah. So they couldn't do online necessarily right now. Yeah. And you some of the, to have right. right. Yeah, you need to get that. Yeah. Yeah, some of the testing that we've done too, um, it sort of works better in person too because you get some of the, you don't always see sort of the nonverbal reactions to something if it's online. Um, so some of the, just the reaction to like someone's initial reaction to what the screen looks like or so, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, uh, that's a good point to do easier, at least, to get parents involved if it's something where they don't have to drive to Lansing or, or something like that. So, all right, next please. Yes, what I was going to ask you is, does any have anything right now that we could direct people to go to? Which is like, is that what you're talking about? Survey is going to be? It's not up yet. Not up yet. Um, I think that they registered for a web, you know, have a, a non a virtual focus. 
That's why don't you like use our, it's on the last page, use our, um, our ESSA email if people okay. want to volunteer in any way. That's why the safest way for us to collect the list, and that's what we did okay. before. Yeah. And then we will, uh, um, on yep. the very last page, it's, MD, it's all in caps, MD dash SI at Michigan.gov. If they send it there, we'll be able to, that's a. Then we can include it. Yep. All right, thank you. Can I say, yep. though? I mean, I just, I'm really excited about this because, I mean, I get the, the purpose of the conversation and accountability is to increase academic achievement, right? That's the whole purpose, but I feel like AF is just this idea of a grade for schools um, in terms of that being the primary force of accountability, but it's not. Parents, students, schools working together, and this facilitates that conversation. So I guess my thing is, as we continue to develop it, um, we're going to need to figure out, in my opinion, how to communicate that. How to communicate that the whole purpose of the transparency dashboard is to facilitate that full conversation and not just say, based on these six rigid ESSA indicators, you get a grade and that's the only thing that matters about the school, the, you know, school that your kid's going to. Um, this facilitates a conversation between parents, students, and schools, which is where accountability is at, not just with one grade and one vector. Because um, I feel like I've, I've had, run into people that say, well, why aren't you spreading this or why are you spreading that? That's the primary reason why. Um, but figuring out how we can encourage parents, how can you use the transparency dashboard to have that conversation? Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. Please, Lupe. Well, <clears throat> the, the, the work is tremendous. You've done so much research. But I am still concerned about many parents having access to understanding webinar and all these things that you're talking about. And, and, it, and looking at the participants, they're all educated people that, that uh, well, the majority of them are educated people that know about computers. Guys, there's parents that have never been to school before. There's parents that are coming from other countries where uh, there's many from Africa that don't even know what a computer is. There's uh, a lot of parents that don't know the language. There's a lot of parents, I can go on and on. And, and so we're talking about, uh, they go to the computer and they click here and they, they go to a webinar. That's not realistic. We're talking about one group of parents one group of parents. Most of the parents are the other 70%. Uh, and so it is a good idea, and I, I, I like the idea. I like the research that you've done, all the work, but I'm still concerned about a big pocket of, of parents. Um, and having said that, so we're waiting for for the federal government to okay our plan. What about the Michigan legislature? Are they going to vote? Is there something in the air that they're talking about how to hold districts accountable? Is this going to be the Bible of how uh, Michigan is going to, you know, where are we at with that? So we are proceeding as this is our plan and this is what will be implemented. If the legislature so chooses, they can always pass a bill that changes our direction. Uh, that's within their powers. But so far they haven't done anything. And you know, I kind of tried to ask the legislature so that we didn't get into this, uh, going in this direction and moving to this direction, is to do what they wanted to do before June 30th. They didn't take any action, so I said, well, we're leading it. We're going to move forward with our plan, and uh, this is it. Now, if the legislature passes a bill, obviously we have to adjust. But uh, you know, Representative Kelly has said he's going to pass a bill. Pavlov has said he's going to pass a bill. We'll see what happens. Okay, so thank you for that answer. Now, so then in, in the federal government, with the federal government, we're waiting for them to approve the plan with the dashboard as part of it. Correct. And if they don't approve it, what happens? We all appeal because we believe we have met the law, and if we have met the law, they should not be able to turn us down. Okay, does that, if we appeal, does that guarantee that that our appeal is going to go in our favor? Well, if I can clarify just a little bit. So the, um, 
the federal plan requires, we talked about it a couple months ago, um, the index system, the zero to 100, so we can get to the, the, CF, the comprehensive support schools. We believe we have a, a federally compliant, we have everything the statute requires and no more in for that. So it, it would be compliant. The dashboard actually exists outside of federal authority. So us building the, this is all our work. So we, we are safe to move forward here. Um, they can't tell us you can't build a transparency dashboard, I guess is my point. Um, they could quibble with us over this component of the index system or that, but since we see that as um, the, the identification system that sits kind of behind the dashboard or alongside or somewhere to help us direct those supports to those partnership districts, uh, we could you know, negotiate with them around exactly what's in there and still keep our transparency dashboard as it is. So okay. basically federal approval and transparency dashboard movement aren't linked. There's, that wouldn't be what would upset that apple cart. Okay, so then when you say we will continue with it here, you mean the department or the state or what are you saying when you say here? I don't remember what I said. In which you said that <laughs> they do will continue with it. We are moving forward with the dashboard as Michigan's plan. Yes. Okay. Is this going to be available in multiple languages? We need to, we, we very much need to translate um, into several languages Maybe for amazing. a lot of reasons. There are some barriers, probably cost being the largest, that okay. good translations are very expensive and there's not. So we would love an investment into that because we are we know we're not serving our populations of parents well if we can't translate. And and you did say that there is, you, there's a drop down where you can pick you know, special needs or ELL. Mm -hmm. So this dashboard is very much friendly to and the videos all be people. In different languages. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just yeah. I wanted to clarify that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item is approval of State Board of Education minutes. Approval of minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Yes. Move. Is there support? Support. It's been moved and supported. Any questions or comments? Say now, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. Co president's reports. Cassandra? Sure. Um, I'd like to offer public congratulations to uh, Detroit Public Schools uh, Community District to Dr. B for exceeding their count expectations. You know, uh, families in Detroit have a choice, and uh, a, a good number have chosen. Um, Detroit Public Schools, I wish them well in the, uh, in the coming year. And uh, Dr. Beatty uh, uh, he, uh, receives full support from the board and from the community in this very praiseworthy work of educating Detroit students. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment to uh, highlight the fact that there's been a movement and we've seen it the last few months now to eliminate the State Board of Education. Uh, as we all know, the Governor's Education Commission suggested this, although they gave a couple of options. There's a recent op-ed that called for the Elimination State Board. Some, legislative, uh, some of the legislature has introduced a constitutional amendment to eliminate the State Board of Education. And so I want to just, um, and, and I'm talking to deaf, I mean, I'm not deaf ears, of the support. choir here. Yeah, I was um, say support of ears. <laughs> support of ears. Um, but I, I, I need to take just a few minutes and kind of, of talk through this a little bit. Um, so first of all, let me just say, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, assume that this is coming from a place of wanting to improve public education, and, um, and it's not simply a partisan or a control issue. But with that being said, let me um, just kind of talk through why this might be a little like misguided, in my opinion. It's true that Michigan is not very well based on national measures. Um, so in 1992, Michigan ranked 21st in fourth grade reading on the NAEP. And in 2003, we slipped to 28th. And by 2015, we're now in 41st. Um, and we can argue the merits of the NAEP, but the rankings are you know, what they are. But the existence of this board has been consistent throughout this entire period. And when we were in the top 10, we existed. 
when there were the bottom 10, we've existed. And we've been elected the same way. We've been actually probably the most consistent um, aspect in education. So if you're concerned about the trajectory, I would say instead of focusing on what's been stable, perhaps we should look at what has changed that could account for this. One being funding, the way we fund our local schools has changed dramatically. In, since the 1990s with Proposal A, moving funding from local districts to the state, which essentially turned children into commodities. Um, governance, much of the oversight of this board was stripped in the 1990s and um, through executive orders, a phenomenon which continues today. Um, choice, uh, regardless of how you feel, unlimited growth of new schools opening in Michigan despite a decline in enrollment is unsustainable. Cyber schools with minimal accountability, takeover of local schools, emergency financial managers, the Education Achievement Authority, the number of children living in poverty, lead, high stakes testing, no child left behind, term limits, um, it's somehow the idea that this is going to create an opportunity to hold the governor accountable, which is what we read in the op-ed, is silly considering they can only run for re-election once. So how are you supposed to do that? Um, despite all of this, this board has actually been able to accomplish a lot in a very bipartisan manner. And you know, we have a great superintendent that we hired, we have the top 10 and 10, uh, actual strategies, partnership models, accountability. I mean, this dashboard is phenomenal and it's gonna be a leader in the country on how you should actually communicate how your schools are doing. We're pushing back on federal efforts to you know, create this one size accountability measures. So um, if you wanna be serious about fixing schools, then I say let's be serious. Eliminating a publicly elected board is not gonna do anything other than remove a very powerful, important voice from the conversation and also at the same time remove the citizens' ability to determine who actually oversees um, education. I don't know why my phone is recording what I'm saying right now. <laughs> <laughs> Something is not right. <laughs> you know, it's really weird. Um, so, <laughs> so I just want to say that if, if the legislature and the governor truly want to uh, improve public schools, then eliminating the State Board of Education is not the thing to do. Actually restoring our authority would be the right thing to do because when we had the authority over public schools in the state of Michigan, our schools actually did really well. So um, I am planning to put these comments into writing and share them with our elected officials and maybe even through an op-ed. If anyone is interested in adding their voice to that, I would you know, certainly welcome that. But um, I'm not gonna just sit back and, and allow this, this uh, framing of our role to continue without a, us having a response to it. Because this is ridiculous and it can't continue. Uh, if I may jump in, if I were a Supreme Court justice, I'd be writing a concurring opinion, and I appreciate you bringing that up uh, today. Uh, I would like to point out two things. Uh, one is, uh, as I pointed out in the Detroit News op-ed, uh, the state rankings are, are really a bunch of horses that are very within a length of each other on a race. So uh, whether you're first or, or, or 20th in that bunching, not statistically that significant. The other thing to point out is that in the time that Michigan fell behind the other states, the other states had moved their kindergarten admission age back, uh, or moved it up from turning uh, six on uh, December, or rather five on December 1st to five on September 1st. Now, two years ago, we changed to, to conform to the other states in this regard. But our students have started out 5% behind all the other states, developmentally speaking. And because of the, the because you just got to go through eight years and we've got to go from, uh, we only change one month per year, it's going to take a total of 11 years, another uh, eight years for these changes to where our students are developmentally uh, on the same, the same age with the other states that we're being compared with. That's one reason 
to believe that we are going to be one of the top 10 in 10 years because by then those changes will have taken place. Now, I've been astounded that all the educational experts that we've had talk to us about this gap, none of them have brought up uh, the, the uh, change in date for kindergarten starting. And I can tell you the reason why they haven't brought it up, because there's no money in it for anybody. Okay? So by making that change and making our students developmentally equivalent with those of other states, we've probably taken the single most important uh, step toward addressing that gap. The other thing I wanted to add is, just to re-echo your point about uh, the, this board's chief responsibility is appointing the state superintendent of public instruction. Michigan has benefited so much from having the longest serving superintendent, uh, Michael Flanagan, um, and, uh, and we have another excellent individual who I expect will also give us a, a good, a similarly lengthy tenure. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that as a sentence. Oh. <laughs> But the continuity is an important aspect of our structure. Our, our Constitution set this up deliberately to insulate a little bit from the political winds uh, the determination of school policy. And there's a, always a cost to change. And it's those who want to make immediate and sometimes inconsiderate changes that want to eliminate the state board and replace it with uh, those who are more directly accountable to the to the voters, uh, and I fully agree with my co-president that that would be uh, an inadvisable move. Uh, and I also and and that's a bipartisan opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. All right. Uh, Susan Broman received an award. The Michigan League for Public Policy presented Deputy Superintendent Susan Broman with the 2017 Sharon Parks Award for Leadership advocacy research to advance the well-being of Michigan's vulnerable residents. So, our Camp T director was supposed to be with us, but isn't feeling well. Jerome Vanden Hewville, I hope I said that right, our director of Camp T, he also received an award for making significant contributions towards creating, delivering, and or sustaining environmental education and or outdoor education. So even though he's not here, we'll say congratulations. The 2017 National Blue Ribbon Schools was named, and we have several, Brewster Elementary in Rochester, Countryside Elementary in Byron, Dix Street Elementary in Otsioga, Forest View Elementary in Cadillac, Elmore Elementary in Plymouth Canton, Hamlin in Rochester, Hamley in Saginaw, Irish Becker in Dearborn, John Allen in Ann Arbor, Lewis Marie Elementary in Gross Point, Lincoln School in St. Joseph, Pinewood School in Denison, and Rochester Adams in Rochester School District. So congratulations <coughs> to all the Blue Ribbon Schools. In terms of ESSA, I did answer that we expect here in the next two to three weeks on our plan. Update on the partnership model. Uh, you, as you know, we work is continuing with the current nine districts, 37 buildings. They recently had a meeting where they all came together and shared what's happening in those districts and the, the reforms that are taking place, learning from each other and talking to each other. We also have added the SRO team uh, back in to the department and working in the partnership districts. So that's good. Uh, we have, uh, their, all the districts are beginning their quarterly meetings are underway. <coughs> While the meetings are at different times and locations, the purpose of this meeting is for all the districts to update the communities, their board, uh, and the, all the partners on what's taking place and the progress uh, that is taking place. And so we certainly continue to work on the partnership agreements. We are working through the 2017 data and updating it for test scores and then expect that uh, add just a few uh, partnership districts this uh, by the end of the calendar year uh, and we'll keep you apprised of that work as well. Um, with that, we'll go to the teacher of the year. Ooh, what you been up to? Yeah, so I feel like, uh, you know, when you've got that great lesson plan for, for the sixth hour of the day and the bell rings and you still have five minutes left uh, in the lesson, 
uh, because we've hit three o'clock here. And so <laughs> usually getting the engagement from the students after the bell is hard, but I'm going to do my best here. Okay. You'll be fine. So um, I just wanted to make you guys aware of a, a program that I'm starting here uh, in West Michigan. It's nice that you guys are, are here. Um, I live just three miles down the road. And uh, for this year, I've, I have a partnership with uh, the Van Andel Education Institute, and they're allowing me to use their space in order to run, run some uh, teacher programming. And so that I've started to think a lot about in the last couple of years of my career is teacher leadership. Uh, mostly because I've been given some opportunities in my district uh, to assume some, some leadership roles. And what I've discovered in my own experiences is that um, as a classroom teacher, I worked very, very hard to have influence and impact on my classroom. And then as I started to think about leadership, uh, and, and, and I was put into some of these leadership roles, I realized how I could have influence and impact on, on more than just what was happening in my classroom. Um, I became department chair, and now I was influencing math teachers. I became an academic support coach at my school, and now I was influencing 100 teachers at my school with professional development. And then the last couple of years, very intentionally, I've been working with specific teachers in my school to develop their leadership uh, skills. Uh, because I realized the value, the, the, the multiplying value uh, of, of leadership. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take what I've done with these teachers at East Kentwood High School and scale it now to the West Michigan area. And so the idea of this program, I created this program called Rising Leaders Unite. And uh, I want to pull teacher leaders from, uh, from, from several different districts in the West Michigan area. And so um, I have two other people that are, are joining me in the, in the planning team. One, one is Tracy uh, Hordeski from, from last year, you guys know well. And then another former colleague of mine, Pete Grostick, who's an educational consultant. So we'll be the planning committee. And what we've done is we've identified uh, specific teacher uh, teachers that we that we think are like top, top 1% show huge leadership potential. So we're trying to really, really curate the best of the best for this group here, right? And we've all identified five or six, and we wanted a, a, a diverse group. So elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, varying levels of leadership uh, experiences. So some have been leaders for years, some have, have no leadership experience. Uh, and then uh, also diverse, culturally diverse. And uh, we ended up uh, mostly teachers. We're going to have a couple of administrators because we want that perspective in the group, and then one social worker. Um, and what I'm hoping is if we get the best of the best together in a room, and we have all this wide variety of perspectives and experiences, that I, I just really think great things are going to happen. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to approach this at a less traditional uh, way to your typical teacher training or like a, a grad school class where like, you read a, a, a textbook and then you talk about it. I, I don't want it to be that traditional type of learning. I want it to be more experiential, where these people are going to bring their own leadership ideas, their own leadership uh, problems that they're having in their schools. We can discuss those real, real problems, and then they can go back to their schools and have have actual actionable items as a result of, uh, of this discussion. So. Uh, we're in the recruiting phase right now. We have 11 different districts from the West Michigan area that I think are going to be represented in this group. Uh, we have our first meeting uh, next month in November. So we're going to have monthly meetings, but then we're also going to have some sort of online uh, forum where we can discuss and collaborate and communicate. And uh, it's, it's sort of exciting because um, I don't know what the lesson plans are for this, this program. I'm really allowing it to be flexible and designing it around like the needs of the group. Um, I, I have to just sort of trust that my, my planning team, that we're going to put together uh, ideas that are going to work for this group. Um, but I'm excited to see where it goes. And, and hopefully, the end goal is that these teachers are going, going to be empowered to go back to their districts uh, to, to promote positive change amongst the, the people that they lead in their, in their districts. Yeah, so um, at, at this point, like the first, the first cohort that I'm running here is an invite only. Um, but, but the idea is if we, can, if we can figure out what works to help develop these teacher leaders, uh, then this will be scalable. And if it's scalable, then, then we're going to start to reach out and see who, who, who wants to do this, who else could, could be available to do this. Uh, but I'm thinking of this as more like, uh, it's almost like an experiment. I want to I see how this works. I want to see what's valuable to, to these teacher leaders. 
so that uh, if we do put together a program that we can scale, that it's something that really can have some impact. Great. Look forward to learning more. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is approval of Camp T spending plan. Michelle Becker and Nikki Snyder have reviewed the budget. Uh, and uh, if you have any comments, we would like to hear them. Camp T is located in Greenville, Michigan, provides an outdoor education setting for students with visual impairment and zoned and operated by the Department of Education. Low incident outreach program is overseen, of course, by the state board. So can I have a motion to approve Camp T's spending plan? Any discussion, Nikki, Michelle, anything you want to add from reviewing? Um, I just want to say, I went there yesterday. And um, it was really great. I think we should have a retreat there. Mm -hmm. We should have uh, all go around the campfire. And, you know. But um, it was beautiful. And I was there with uh, Dan Geis and uh, Roxanne Balfour from uh, here, uh, who works at the department. Um, and but Dan, they really do a lot with um, limited resources. And uh, Dan Geis in particular, I know Jeremy was able to join us. Um, but uh, this is a guy who, they just, who does all this work on the place, saves them all kinds of money, is completely dedicated. And they have lots of people from out there. Attendance is going up. They're, um, they're hoping to do more um, to build some mini cabins, and they showed them where. And, uh, uh, and they, I don't know if there's any way that there could be greater appropriations. I know they get some that helps them with some food. Um, for the campers, and they make it really affordable. It's open to um, any, yeah, other groups of the blind get the first, first right. dibs. Groups that can come with here, paraprofessionals, teachers, and a lifeguard. If they have something that they plan in advance, they can, they can do that. And families come, and what I, I love that the idea that they bring families of kids with disabilities together, and that's why they want the mini cabins, because they might need some space sometimes. <coughs> um, to, to separate the day, uh, but it's also a chance for families, to, uh, parents to bond and to talk to each other who are dealing with similar types of issues. So um, it, it's beautiful. They took me on a canoe ride. Oh, yeah. They were, I didn't climb the climbing wall though, but Dan did it for me, which was really sweet of them. Because <laughs> they all just watch you, and it was fun watching them. Um, so, anyway, I, I think it's a wonderful place. In it, in should um, certainly if you live around here. It's not that far to go visit. So I encourage everyone to come. Uh, I think it's uh, they're doing great and they're within their budget. And strongly support approving and considering ways to increase funding so they can do even more. All right. With that, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Consent agenda. Are there any items for which to have removed from the consent agenda prior to vote? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion on the consent agenda? So mm -hmm. moved. Supported. Discussion questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Comments by the State Board of Education members. Are there any board members who wish to offer comments at this time? Tom, please. I, uh, listening to the uh, presentations at the beginning of the different uh, districts and noted that a lot of them were getting uh, student engagement feedback and it was not based on the dropout rate, which is I think how we're defining student engagement. If I remember right, somehow that was how uh, at one point we were going to define it. For attendance or something. For attendance, yeah, yeah something. So I mean, yeah, this yeah. was actually surveys of students, which I've talked about and I, I'm glad that some can do it. I know that we probably can't require it statewide, but I do think that's the way to do it. I heard that's all that was how they in, how they measure student engagement. So I think that's better. Uh, I heard this morning or this morning from the presentations joy a lot in the joy in teaching. And it was something that I had uh, was invited by Pam to go speak at the NAACP uh, event last uh, last week and I mentioned that I I'm gathering that there is a lack of joy in many areas for teaching that it's, and we've got to look at ways to bring that back, so whether it's getting rid of the you know, numerous observations, you know, just all the checklists and things, that's what I am understanding is that it's just as becoming 
so administrative, and I don't know how much of it's coming top down or if it kind of uh, starts at the top but then it gets gets added on at each level or layer uh, as it goes down to the teachers. But I do think that we've got to look at ways to bring back joy. And it wasn't just me talking about it last Friday, but one of the uh, former uh, teachers that was at the, at the on the panel said the exact same thing. That they're just, she left because there was no joy in teaching. She left teaching. Um, I, this was good about the, you know, the benefit of hearing from the local folks uh, and getting outside of Lansing. I understand this hasn't happened very often. And it really is, I, I, I found that just hearing what's happening, I'd like to be able to, I wish we could get more time. I'd love to hear more about what they're struggling with, what they're, and, you know, just, I don't know, I'd like to hear more. And, um, and maybe when we have lunch, maybe bring in some local teachers for their lunch break. I know they don't have a lot of time, but or local local folks so we can just have that more flavor for the local for where we're going uh, and I, I see we're going to go at Wayne Risa in February so I really am encouraged to continue to do this and then finally and I've talked to a couple board members about this I really think that we need to, to carve out some time at monthly meetings and talk about these partnership agreements and how these things are going at the 37 buildings that I mean, this should be a focus of this. I mean, if we're calling or the state is calling these schools quote unquote failing or kind of struggling, whatever, I'm not sure that those are actually accurate, but if, assuming they are, that we should really as a board carve out time and leave. this is one area that we should be focusing on. And um, you know, whether it's bringing in the, the school, I don't, you know, and, and not with, just to really understand and, and agree. I'd like, to, I'd like to hear, make sure that we kind of like what, what is happening and kind of buy into it. I think the voters would expect that one of the things this board ought to do is where there's where there's difficulties that we're look what are we doing about it? And I'd like to be able to say, well, they're doing something about it. MDE is well, I'd like to be able to say that we are doing something about it. So I plan on putting it, try to put it on the next agenda. Um, we'll talk about it further. Okay, just kind of every board meeting. All right, uh, future meeting dates, November 14th, 9.30 at the state uh, at MDE, December 12th at MDE, January 9th at MDE, and February 13th, we'll be back out on the road at Wayne Risa, barring any snowstorms. Uh, look forward to that, and as Tom just said, any items you want on the agenda, please let us know. Mainly, I want to thank uh, Ken ISD and their staff for hosting us today, and for the students who made a uh, great breakfast and a great lunch for us. And, have the opportunity to be with them. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.